Let's do the damn thing. Oh, you know what time it is. It's time to take it to the burn land. It's about to go down. Hope you're all ready. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, let's go. Yeah. Come and roll with me to the burn land. Friends got to giving you the word, man. Any other BS is absurd, man. Sports talk and they give it to you firsthand. They can talk turps. They can talk O's. Yeah, they both lit. That's how it goes. Baltimore squad. Ravens and Poe. Better tune in. Here gonna show. Birdland, Birdland, Birdland. BS. Birdland, Birdland, Birdland. BS. It's all about that BS, baby. What's up, BSers? What's up, peeps? I'm back in the studio tonight. We got a full house. Fred, Scott, Ryan, James, Drew, everybody but Brian. Brian's got the goddamn sniffles. He can stay the hell away. He got that. He got that. Well, he I, got I'm that, not going to say he got the Rona. Yeah, but I'm, not got, gonna, I'm not even going to put that bad juju on him. No, no. I'm not going to put that bad no. juju it's on just, him. He, he, he's just got cough drops in front of him. We were like, <laughs> stay, stay your ass home. <laughs> Uh, what's up, BS Nation? How you guys feeling after a big, big playoff win? As you can yeah. see, changing the narrative is Lamar and this Ravens team. I love it. Changed quite a few narratives. Yeah. Uh, well, the Titans and King Henry uh, get dethroned. Yeah. Yeah. The Ravens win a big one out in Tennessee. Up next, team travels up north to Buffalo to take on Josh Allen, Stefan Diggs, Here, Terp. and the red hot Buffalo Bills. This is going to be a game Saturday night. Listen, you can get in all the drinking you want to. It's a Saturday night. Ain't nobody got to get up on a Sunday. Look at you church going, people. I know you got church to do on Sunday mornings. <laughs> but outside of that, nobody's got to be to work on Sunday unless you work retail. I understand all that. You know, everybody that lives the 9 to 5 lifestyle, you ain't got to work on Sunday, right? Nah. Drink it up. Live it up. Have 8 o'clock. Drowning your sorrows if we lose. <laughs> Drink out of cheer Don't even for winning. put that out there, Scott, if we lose. I'm, I don't want to hear that shit. Golly. <sighs> and this Terps hoop squad, Ryan, are they the worst team in the Big Ten? Are they one of the best in the Big Ten? This bipolar ass team, I can't figure them out. Uh, nobody can. Uh, the lack of size is going to do that too. You got to shoot to shoot. That's what they do some nights. That's right. That's right. And we're talking TikTok, a free agent Super Bowl coach, and some big stories out of the MLB in this week's run. We haven't talked MLB all season comes or like all off season, so I'm kind of excited to at least. Touch on it. Right. Touch on some of the things that have been happening. Glad somebody's sure. excited. I've kind of forgotten about baseball. <laughs> even more breaking news that's not even in here that we'll oh, get into 162 later. 162-game schedule. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> There's more on top of that from today. Baseball what? Yeah, right. <laughs> I, forgot I about really it. liked the 60 games. Can we do that again? <laughs> <laughs> Before we do anything, we do want to remind you, if you've ever been injured at work or in an auto accident, weren't sure who to call, 855-MD-CRASH. The Maryland personal injury attorneys that will have your back. If you find yourself in that unfortunate situation, just like I have, give our team at MD Crash a call right away. We all, know, we all know the cost of medical bills, lost wages, and pain and suffering. It can all add up quickly and potentially put you in a bad financial place. If you want a team that will handle your case, big or small, and just give you some peace of mind, save this number now like you should have for the last year and a half that they've been our sponsor. <laughs> save this number now, 855-MD-CRASH. It's 855-632-7274. Be sure to follow them on Facebook for some fun giveaways, including gift cards to some local restaurants for whenever the hell you can use them. <laughs> Man, I wanted to get through that as fast as possible because I am just so amped and so pumped to talk about this win. This was, you talk about getting the monkey off your back, right? Yeah. Changing the narrative, all the haters out there with Lamar, and he can't win a big game. He can't come from behind. They can't beat the Titans. Done, done, and fucking done. I love it. I love it. The I don't want to hear about it anymore. No, I, I'm so done. I was so happy to hear Stephen A. go off yesterday and be like, "We can't say it anymore. We, we all just need it. to shut up." <laughs> exactly. You just should have shut up from the first, from the get go. That's yeah. all it was. But no, I'm glad he finally admits things because Stephen A. usually doesn't. Yeah. So it was nice to actually hear him tell everybody <laughs> that they all need to shut up and <laughs> stop bringing it up. That's right. This this series though, man, with the Titans, it's been a uh, it's been a rivalry for a long time. Right, oh, yeah. you know, this goes back to late '90s, early 2000s, the Ray Lewis era, the you know the first Super Bowl run, all that stuff. Uh, we you know, talked about it last week on the show. The road team has won every game in the playoffs <laughs> in the series, and that continued 
uh, as the Ravens now lead the series three games to two. Yeah, it's it's exciting to kind of turn that page. You know, previously, obviously, we didn't have it. Lamar was only a part of one of those, you know, when it comes to the playoffs. So it was nice to see him turn that page for us or for himself, but us as a franchise as well right. um, and be able to make that move and kind of get back on the winning side of things when it comes to that rivalry. Because um, it's like you said, this was this is what I think of when I think of Titans Ravens, right? It was a hard hitting game, right? We saw a few big hits. It was a pretty good amount of defense in this game on both sides, yeah. which is what we've been used to. But the offensive spotlight was still there, at least on the Ravens side. Yeah. And they literally had a Megatron size player at running back when this <laughs> rivalry was good and Eddie George and now in Derrick Henry, they were the big guys that we needed to stop. Ray Lewis was able to do that yeah. pretty much single-handedly against Eddie George back in his day. And now the Ravens, like I said, as a team kind of get that monkey off the back, hold Derrick Henry, the <laughs> king to 40 yards rushing. Unbelievable. So we're going to talk a yeah. little bit about that. Uh, we talk about changing the narratives, right? Another one that we kind of skim over here, we don't really mention, the narrative with Greg Roman sticking ah, to the script. It was so <laughs> lovely to see that. Yeah. Like, I was like, all right, when's he going to do it? Right. When's he going to do it? It's coming. It's coming. And I, he didn't do it. And I was like, yeah, third quarter hit. And I was like, he's sticking to the game plan. They got behind 10 to nothing in this game. And I sat there. I was like, here we go. Lamar's going to have passes. 55 <laughs> passes in this game. We're going to lose this game. Here we go. But he didn't. He didn't abandon ship. He stuck to his guns. He stuck to doing what this team is is, is built to do. My only, my only piece with this was he, he did stick to that. But there were a little bit more designed runs for Lamar that – than I really would have liked to have seen because it, Lamar, they were scripting it out every time. Every time it was a design love run for Lamar, they had him and they were stopping. He maybe got three three yards if he was lucky in those situations or really in lot to back to the line of scrimmage when he was running to the outside right. on most of those. So to see that that change in them, kind of especially the second half, just drop back and let Lamar be Lamar. When he doesn't see the pass, then he'll find it. Yeah, And they broke it down. Dan Orlowski broke it down, uh, I think it was yesterday, Great breakdown on the bi on the big screen where he broke down the safeties biting up and then letting Lamar be Lamar and the shiftiness that he is and the little shimmy shimmy that he, that he goes. shimmy shimmy yo <laughs> shimmy yeah shimmy yeah yeah I don't know where the button is anymore uh, but Did it perfectly <laughs> yeah we need the button sure exactly <laughs> uh, oh, but yeah so again continuing the narrative. Harbaugh, I know certain people in this room, maybe one, has been really critical <laughs> of John Harbaugh over the years. Well, he becomes the winningest head coach in NFL history in road games in the playoffs. He now has eight playoff road wins. That's yeah. unheard of. He's yeah. the winningest coach in NFL history. Well, and just, you know, what, one day, or I guess it was one or two days before uh, the miracle in Denver, right, the Mile High Miracle, yeah. right. So there's another win that happened, right, in a close game, right. Here he pulls it off again. He's the master of not letting the road hurt him in the playoffs, right. That's true. So all right, let's let's dive a little bit into this game. We're gonna start on the defensive side of the ball. You want to win against the Titans? Obviously, number one was stopping Derrick Henry. We talked about that. Keys to the game last week. Key number one: stopping Der Derrick Henry. Well, they hold this team to a total of 216 total yards. Yeah. We've seen Derrick Henry run for 216 <laughs> himself. Yeah, against us. You held them to a total of 216 yards. Now, granted, it didn't start out great. No. The game did not look great in the first quarter. But it wasn't from the run game. No, it, it wasn't, wasn't from Derrick Henry. It wasn't. It was key number two. Yeah. A.J. AJ Brown. Brown. And we said, you know, we probably see some some physical up on the line banging between Har Marlon Humphrey and, and A.J. Brown, and he and did was. that. And let me tell you, A.J. Brown put Marlon to work for so, that first quarter. A.J. Brown, I mean, like I get the whole letting him play, but I got to get your guys' thoughts on the, the touchdown because I know my, my instant gut reaction, and I still look at it, and the way that it happened, it is the definition of a push-off and offensive pass interference. It, is, it yeah. is by the book. Arm fully extended, pushing him downward to get access to the ball. 
Yeah, and the thing with A.J. Brown is A.J. Brown is a strong wide receiver, uh, so he can easily manhandle somebody with one arm. Just because he's not this, you know, frail, armed, weak wide receiver right. doesn't mean that he can't control somebody with one arm, and he clearly did. So at first, my instant reaction was, what the fuck? Where's the offensive pass interference? My tried to keep my sanity reaction after that was, okay, it's early in the game. If the refs, if the refs are going to let this go, then they need to be consistent with it. Let this. it go on both sides. And let it go on both sides. But, unfortunately, we Willie saw some Sneed. plays go the other way. <laughs> Willie Sneed with a, a, a bump and rub. I've had wor- I had worse shoulder chips in high school than that. Yeah. Like, seriously. That was, walking if, in the hallway. If Jayshon Jones would have done what he did in that game, if they threw a flag on Willie Sneed, Jayshon Jones would have been ejected. <laughs> right. that's, that's one of those times that needs to be investigated because that didn't change the end of the game, but that did change the point spread. We would have won by yeah. more than seven and a half if yeah. we would have got the touchdown. We're kicking a field goal that kept it underneath the seven and a half. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. But I will say, though, I mean, listen, Marlon, one of his, his, his more rougher games i think of the year and he admitted that even yeah. i don't know if you watch on instagram he does these ig live videos after yeah. every win especially on the road because they get on the plane and yeah. do this thing and he admitted love the outfit by the way oh i did yeah the, with the <laughs> cowboy hat and everything the tennessee, the it, tennessee you know it was clean. cowboy i loved it it was clean uh but he had he had a rough game but then he bounced back later on because really after that first quarter aj brown wasn't much of a factor at all no I mean, for the for the rest of the game, they did a good job of shutting down arguably one of the best receivers and, and definitely a top 10 receiver in the NFL. Right. And they, they were able to shut him down in that second half. Yeah, he made the impact there in the first quarter. But outside of that, you really didn't hear his name called all that much. I think he had the one toe tap on the sideline uh, that he made when they were trying to make that, that quick run before the interception. But outside of that, I mean, he he wasn't a factor. They were really able to limit him. Yeah. Well, I got to ask you guys out there. So, so Drew, let me get your take. They they stop the king, hold Derrick Henry, eighteen carries, forty yards, oh, look at no that touchdowns. Couch cam. Right, I love it. I got to get your I got to get your opinion here. Did you expect the Ravens' defense fully healthy, getting Calais Campbell back, getting Derrick Wolf back, getting Brandon Williams back? Did you expect this kind of performance out of this D? I, I, yes, but I I wouldn't say forty yards. Not that well, two hundred and sixteen total yards. That they actually gave up? No, I wouldn't have expected that. Right. But it, I, with the defense, everyone being healthy, and any of the healthy, any of the scratches were, you know, not a Jimmy Smith, or, you know, like Calais or, or Brandon Williams. I know we kind of expect them to play anyway, but without any of those key guys being, you know, out, with everyone being in, I figured that you know what they're going to make a game of it. I didn't. Couldn't have told you they were out. King Henry to forty. Yeah, that's it's kind of where I was at with it. I expected Derrick Henry to get his. I'd expect him to yeah. get a hundred yards in this game. I was fully prepared to chalk it up as he's going to get a hundred yards rushing. Let's keep him below two hundred. Like that. That was my yeah. goal in this game. Let's not let Derrick Henry single handedly beat us in this game. But, they didn't do that, and I tell you. Having a full, healthy defensive line just goes to show the investment that Eric De- Eric DaCosta put well, in in the offseason paid off. And it's not just that, right? These guys came in with with a vengeance, right? And I loved, uh, you know, during the week, they actually interviewed, uh, I forget who it was, um, I think it was Ryan Mink interviewed Derek Wolf, right, for, for the Ravens site and everything. And one of the things they said was, you know, what is the what is the the tone for this locker room considering what happened last year in the playoffs and you know what's going on and a guy like Derek Wolf I thought had the perfect perfect response with this because he came back and said look he's like yeah there's guys in the locker room that had that but I got my own my own enemies with them I I we lost to them in a in a game that was too close and we lost to them in overtime because the RD couldn't hold up I got my own problems with them. So yeah, I'll, I'll piggyback on them, but I want to I want to get payback and revenge for what happened when I was on the field with our team, right? And I'm gonna do it, and, and damn well if he didn't, right. right? Gets a sack on on Tannehill, the only sack of the game, yep. right? And does well, but this this defense in front, especially, they came in with a vengeance. It was this mentality, right? Because we saw the videos of Calais barking before the game, right? Right, love those videos. Because he's not, he doesn't See, seem like a Mike, smack talker. Calais Campbell reminds me of 
Michael Clark Duncan, but as a football player, like this big brute of a dude, but he, and he's he's just so soft spoken and like he wouldn't harm a fly. To see him fired up before the game, barking at the at the the Titans. Oh, was, the Tennessee Titans were doing that, bro. Like, before God, the yeah. game even started, when I saw that, I was getting pumped. I'm jumping around. I was so excited because. To see somebody like that really kind of get in this element, you got to remember, Clayus Campbell's been in the league for a while now. Hasn't had a whole lot of playoff experience. Hasn't had yeah. a whole lot of playoff exposure. So this is big for him. He doesn't know how many more of these he's, opportunities he's going to have left. And it's win or go home at this situation. Yeah. Right? So he's doing everything he can. And I do believe, I'm the type of person, I do believe that little bit of a psychic, you know, psyche can mess with somebody, especially younger players, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying it, it yeah. had a part, but it could. I mean, between him, just this defensive front as a whole, and them shutting down, you know, Derrick Henry, yeah. and, and it played it played a huge role in this game because you were you were talking about what you were seeing and what they were showing on the sideline with Henry. Yeah, see, Derrick Henry. I mean, I don't know if it was being just frustrated because they were losing or frustrated with certain play calls or what was going on, but you could visibly see Derrick Henry going at Mike Vrabel. Vrabel was following Derrick Henry to the bench, and they're just jawing at each other back and forth, which isn't necessarily a bad and thing. And it wasn't I mean, overly aggressive. Let's, it not, wasn't. let's not paint I'm not that picture. To, yeah, but yeah, I'm not trying to blow this out of proportion or anything, but you could see... There was a conversation happening. There was a conversation happening. Derrick Henry wasn't happy with something. Henry wasn't even looking him in the eye. No. He, he like, it was like he took his helmet off, and he was focused on wherever he was walking to on the bench, and right. that was it. Yep. So, yeah, I mean, just they were able to shut everything down in this game. But you, you talk about the defensive line, and one guy that we absolutely have not mentioned in this game who has probably, in my my opinion, been one of Eric DaCosta's best dumpster dives, right? We talk about LJ Fort and what he did last year and what he's done a little bit this year, right, yeah. and the addition of him. Bringing back Pernell McPhee oh, huge. has been huge, and I think he had one of his best games this, this game – uh, you know, he just he was all over the field. He's that vocal leader yeah. in, in the huddle for the defense. Uh, he led the team in tackles in this game. Every play, you saw him hustling towards the ball. Every play, you could see all of these guys doing that. But he was he was definitely boisterous about it, loud about it. Um, you know, when when he was getting to Henry. And stopping him because he was putting his hands on Henry a lot in this game, right? And he really made it made it a vocal scene. And I think I think they were they were barking at Henry a little bit, and that was probably just furthering the frustration. Which when you get a guy underneath the guy's skin and you're shutting him down the way that you are, right? Some guys start to break down, and it seemed to be that was happening with Henry. They were barking at him. He wasn't liking it. He wasn't liking the play call, the usage, whatever it may have been, but it was getting under his skin more and more, so he's trying harder to find the holes, and we were just shutting him down in the holes left and right. He, Derrick Henry had zero first down runs in this game. Yeah. Zero. Yeah. I, I mean, mean that's, that's unheard of. I don't think it's ever happened to him in his career. I mean, let's look at this. You, you mentioned it before. 18 carries, 40 yards. That's almost, it's what, 2.1 yard a clip? Yeah. Right? And I mean, they hit him 11 times out of those 18 attempts, 11 times either at the line or behind the line. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. That's he, insane. He, he just was not a factor in this game, which but was awesome to see. I got to give Drew some credit. And, you know, I'll give myself a little credit. You know, I'm a one to toot my own horn, but I'll do it on a time to time, like once a week or something like that. Got to give Drew a little bit of credit here, right? So we talked about it. Uh, Marcus Peters, right? We talked about how how much of an impact uh, he could be in these playoffs. You know, we Marcus Peters is one of those guys. It seems this is just what it appears to me is that sometimes he can be a little disengaged, right? There's times where he just he doesn't look as into the game as he does. But when the lights shine the brightest, and when there's some kind of animosity in the game, or there's some kind of like friction in the game. Marcus Peters steps his game to the next he level. He always, I'd say nine out of 10 times, he's going to make a big play in this game. And Drew, he had the game saving interception, the game clinching interception. No lie. Like he, when he picked it off, I was like, I was right. <laughs> well, I, but I, I did. I mean, I thought, I think like, and I said it last week, it wasn't just this game. I think if you're going to go to the Super Bowl and win it all, you're going to have to have those timely interceptions where mm -hmm. and then granted in this game it did it you weren't ever really backpedaling 
But in those situations where we do it a lot in our group text, like, God, man, right here, they need a pick. Yeah. And that was one of those moments where you're like, look, just get a get something, get a pick, get a fumble, and this whole this game's over. Something to close out the game. Yeah, it, yeah. Was, it was hell. It was so great to see. Yeah. James, you've been super, super quiet over there, so I, I need to get an opinion out of you. Did you ever expect this team to hold the Titans down to 216 total yards like this? Did you see this kind of defensive effort coming? Not really, but they proved it. And I was a big Peters guy. I told you last week, I, I love the guy. I, you know, you guys give him crap for, like, dumb plays or whatever, but that guy is a playmaker. Yep. And yeah. It, it, that offense line, uh, again, showed up. It's the first time they were healthy, all of them out there. And they also said, uh, I think they're talking about, this is, a, um, like, like you said, it was a team where, they were meant – they've been practicing to tackle at the legs. Right. Don't take Henry up above the pads. Hit him at the legs, and that's what they did. They they stopped him. It was – hats off to the defense. I'll yeah. be honest. There was there was one play that I remember where Derrick Henry was a shoelace tackle away from taking it to the oh, house. Oh, yeah. It would have been a 60-yard touchdown. It would have changed the entire game. But I don't know who it was that grabbed his foot, but he saved it from happening. Because I'm telling you, I think it was, it was I think green, was green that, grass from there on out. I think that was the one where it was – Pernell McPhee came out of the backfield to, to grab him. If I remember correctly, he grabbed him because it was – if he didn't get him, he was gone. Right. I remember the play that you're talking about. So, yeah, it, it's definitely great to, to be able to see. Let's shift gears. All right. Let's move on. We talked enough about the defense. Let's talk about the offense now. Uh, we got to talk about Lamar, like we said prior to the, you know, the show. Finally gets all these narratives and all these, you know, the crap that, that the national media out there wants to give. You want to know Lamar why? Off his back. You want to know why he was able to do that? Because Greg Roman didn't call fifty-five passes. <laughs> that is very true. He he called. He probably called like maybe thirty pass plays. But Lamar was able to do what Lamar does. Yeah. Right. I talked about it earlier when he, when you give him the ability to scan. I don't see anybody. I got a hole. I'm taking it. Like they were talking about it. Dan Olofsky talked about it on that one play, leaving early out of the pocket. He is the best at that. Right. When he sees a hole, he hits it, and he doesn't care what's downfield. We've seen times where we're like. So and so's downfield and wide open. Didn't matter because when he gets out there and he gets into open space, he's almost unstoppable. Yeah. I love. I forget what uh, who posted it on Twitter. Somebody posted it on Twitter and it's like the three phases of trying to catch Lamar. One of them is while he's in the pocket. One of them is just as he gets into the you know up to the second level, and then the other one is where the second level is chasing him. Right. right? So it's like th those three levels. It's perfect to kind of see that and, and relate to that because he really does do well. Even though in this game, it didn't look good at first. No, and I, and I tell you, you, you brought up a great point earlier. and We were texting about this in the group during the game. I think one of the things that kind of frustrated Ryan and I, because we were going back and forth on this, was the amount of designed runs for Lamar, right? Yeah. Lamar's biggest chunk plays with his legs come off of that backyard football, right, where he's rolling out of the pocket, looking downfield, trying to find open a receiver, can't find anybody, and he makes a play happen with his legs. That's where you see Lamar at his best with his legs. These design runs – this is us being spoiled fans. Yeah. The, these design runs only get, you know, four, five, six yards at a time. That's just not <laughs> enough for us as Ravens fans. We want to see these 50, 60-yard runs um, just because we know how exciting Lamar can be yeah. when you get him out in the open field. Uh, and that was my, my only point of content. I know Ryan's got something to say. Go ahead, Ryan. I do think that the RPOs, he was – not trusting his reads as much because he knew the narrative. He knew that this game he had to win, and I think he pulled that ball a lot more often than he would have if that pressure hadn't been on him. I right. hope that fixes because this pressure's off now, and he gets back to handing the ball off or keeping it just like he would in the regular season. Because right. I swear he was holding a little tighter onto that ball on those RPO options. Yeah, I, I agree with that, but I definitely feel like Lamar played Lamar ball a lot oh, yeah. more in this game, uh, especially as the game went on. He got more comfortable, and again, he started you know, using those, those reads to his advantage as the game went on. The only, if I'm going to knock anything about Lamar in this game, and there's not much to knock, it, it had to be the interception, right? The, inter the bad throw that he had on the interception. Now, I watched this, and I watched it live happen, and I could see it happen. The reason he threw this interception wasn't just because it was a bad throw. It wasn't just, oh, he was off the mark. Lamar, what we talk about with him all the time is are the arm angles, 
right? Right. Lamar can throw from all different slots. He can throw from all different arm angles. He tried to throw this further out, right, further almost sidearm when he was trying right. to throw this. He felt pressure from the right-hand side. You could see it when they show the camera angle behind him. He felt pressure from his right. In mid-throw, he brings his arm angle in, and when he brings his arm angle in, just the slightest bit, the ball gets wobbled. It goes, changes yeah. the direction of the ball, and the ball now comes inward versus that ball being thrown towards the sideline, and that's why it ended up being a bad throw. Either way, again, it's it's a small it's a small problem, but in these big playoff win or go home type situations, you can't have the, those kind the of mistakes. The only thing I would say to that is is the play calling in that portion of the drive was we it was where we all were kind of like. What's what's Roman doing? Right, because it was throw after throw after throw after throw, and so it's it's one of those things. I think in that series there were two there were two runs in that series, if I remember correctly, because the rest are more passable. and some of them worked out. But he feels that pressure. So I, I I get you. It's definitely a bad throw. Change the arm angle. He feels pressure. I get all that stuff. But it's also. You, you, sh you can't put your quarterback in that situation where he feels like he has to throw when in honest in all honesty he's better when you give him the chance and say okay run right, right? and find the open open space bad decision on his part could he have could he have pulled it and tucked and run maybe I'd have to go back and look to see if he even had a hole at right. that point uh, but I, I just I don't know a little bit of play calling there as well for me so next thing I gotta ask and I'm asking this to the peanut gallery out there all three of you right That's is it safe to call him Hollywood again? Marquise Brown has a big game. Seven receptions, 109 yards, no drops. Can we call him Hollywood yet? No? Not enough? No. When he does it in the Super Bowl, then I'll give it back to him. <laughs> yeah, we, we stopped calling him Hollywood, and it worked out pretty well. Let's keep it not here. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, seven catches, 109 yards, no drops in this game, that being the key. Uh, and what I really liked, what I saw out of him in this game, was that he caught the ball, didn't have any fear, turned up field, and got those extra yards. A lot of the struggles that we talked about with him earlier, a lot of frustrations, I guess, was that he would catch the ball, drop, and go straight to the ground. The only thing I would say say about that is the fact that he was when he was doing it, he was knew, he knew the defender was behind him at that point because he'd already broke loose from the defender at that point. So he's got open space, and that's where he's able to he's turning because he knows his defender is here. Right. That's the only thing I would say. There were two times that he caught it, and there's a defender right in his face, and you watch him do that like hesitation and instead of just saying. Go and put your pedal. To You're the one of the fastest the extra... guys in the in the league. Just go, just go, <laughs> just go. You don't have to do that. You you should be able to do that that shimmy shake mid step, right? You know, with your speed and your your you know breakaway speed, your shiftiness, all that stuff. But he's not doing it. He's more so trying to find that create that hole. Let's say he's right. trying to create the space, which I have respect for. But when the guy's standing in front of you and squared up to you, and you're both frozen standing still. I don't care. Drew, what do you got? No, that, that, that's why he's still the Riddler to me. <laughs> still the Riddler. Because of that. Because it is. Once you catch the ball, go. There's no stutter. Like you just said, Scott, you 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 almost have leverage over a defender when you're in that position where you're both standing still and you're head-to-head. -head, you need to go. That's, yeah, that's why he's still the Riddler to me. But it was nice that there were no drops. Uh, yeah. yeah, and listen, this has been consistent for the last five, six games now. He is getting better. He yeah. is showing more confidence in himself. Lamar showing more confidence in him. This this is only going to be good. They're, like, <laughs> they're clicking again, and we yeah. we talked about them like pre you know pre game and post game when they weren't they weren't something was off about them. Yeah. They weren't hanging out. You're seeing it now. You're seeing the videos. Lamar shows up. Who's right behind him or right in front of him? Hollywood. Right. Every time he's walking into the stadium, they're together. Four catches of fifteen plus yards. That's what you expect out of his type of receiver. Yeah. Out of that type of receiver. Get him into open space. changing type speed. Go ahead. He might be Hollywood, Florida. We got to see if he gets back to Hollywood, California. This I point. like it. I, 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 did, I gave you a lot him, of time to think I, that one I, I do want to give him... <laughs> you did. I do want to give him a lot of credit, though. I saw a grown man stiff arm from that little tiny mm, man that yeah. is, and that weight Chips training calls him fetus. finally worked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that weight training he had finally... That was that one play all year I saw. That was that worked. I, right. That's it. That's that motion you've been working in that weight room. Right. There you go. <laughs> uh, I guess on the offensive side, the, the guy who probably 
struggled the most offensively, Mark Andrews. He had kind of an up and down game you know, in this game. We're seeing a little bit of a pattern when it comes to to Andrews when it comes to the big time games, right? He says some struggle. We, I, I had right, my Steve heart, a. my heart skipped a beat. <laughs> you guys all know the throw I'm talking about because we talked about it. The thing, my heart skipped a beat when he bobbled. Right, yeah. he had the one bobble that he was able to get. I think eleven or twelve yards on. This was, was after he'd already had two drops. Right, and so it's like he had. You saw that hit his chest and kind of fall, and you saw him like just just a little shift to try to make sure he secured the ball, and he did. Thank God. But it was like something's up with him when it when the lights come on. I don't know if it's pressure, but somebody's just got to get with him and go. Man, it's just another game. Yeah, I we, we need we need to see him start stepping it up the next night. I mean, he he came on like gangbusters the first eight, nine weeks of the season. After that, it's it's you know, he's had the issues with the drops and just hasn't put up the the touchdowns and, and the big impactful plays like we expect out of him. I think I know what it is. I think he's he's afraid Pat Ricard's going to take his job. <laughs> Pat Ricard can take anybody's job at this point. <laughs> the dude can do fucking anything. I mean, he's a freaking 300 He's 310 pound pounds that could do fucking anything at this point. Uh, but no, I, the, the thing with Andrews, I just I want to see him uh, get involved early in the offense. Yeah. And we're going to talk about this with the, with the Bills game coming up. I want to see him get early and often involved uh, because he's going to be critical to this team's success if they're going to make a Super Bowl run. Yeah, I mean, he's got to get he's got to get some of the catches over the middle. We've got to get back to that. I've been noticing they've been trying to hit him on the outside more, and I don't know if that's due to coverage, you know, just good coverage and draping over him, or if he's not creating and creating separating space, or Lamar's just not seeing him. I, I don't know. I haven't looked at all the game film to sit there and break that down. It's just something I've noticed. I've seen him catching a lot more outside outside route balls. I'm not seeing him over the middle like we're used to with him. And you know when the drop off has been? It's been ever since Nick Boyle went down. Yeah, I they mean, diminished. you got one guy to focus on at that it, point. Exactly. They don't have that second threat. Because, I mean, now granted, we all know that Nick Boyle's specialty is a blocking tight end. That's why we signed him. It's how he got paid the money he did. But let's not kid ourselves. Nick Boyle yeah. ended up being a pretty good receiving tight end over the last couple of years. Uh, and not having him out there, they're kind of throwing these makeshift guys out there just to you know to have a couple bodies out there to tight end. But nobody's had the impact uh, since he left. Well, I mean, the closest impact has been Pat Ricard, right. right? When you're throwing him in those tight end formats, you know, or in tight end formations, when sometimes they're putting him in the in the backfield as the fullback, and they they do a run play action, a play action, uh, and they wind up, you know, going out to him and he's out on the sideline. I mean, he, he's doing well and he's been, he's been quite impressive. Craig zero says he feels a lot of pressure in this big game. And I think his sugar traps because of the stress. That's, that's, that's not half wrong, man. I mean, that's kind of how diabetes works. That's yeah. a really good call. I've never thought about it. I'm pretty sure he's got enough scientific technology going on to make it handle, but it's, it's a point so, I never yeah. thought of. So to that point, to <laughs> that point, and talking about Pat Ricard, uh, Mark Andrews had, had told a story the other day, apparently the other day in practice, his sugar had dropped. Well, who comes to the rescue? Pat Ricard <laughs> with the Gatorade and the Snickers bar or something like that to get his sugar up. He's, How? I mean, this guy does it all. medical staff's job. This guy, this guy deserves it. a Ravens lifetime contract. Like, I just, yeah. I love Pat Ricard. I mean, he's he's just, he's such a physical player. He's defeated all the odds. He's become a Pro Bowl player at the NFL level. Like, it's just, it's crazy to see the development and he's he could be a pro a pro bowl player at multiple positions right i mean he's he is he is the best utility guy i mean there's not many out there right, right? and they get recognition and that's one of the things that he's he gets and he started to actually get national attention for it. they were talking about it when he got the ball it was like this is the guy this is the guy that's caught more passes than any other 300 pound guy in the league yeah. right and so it's it's because he's so versatile he can play offense he can play defense he can play fullback he can play linebacker he can play tight end he is so versatile hell i think you could put him out there at in the slot and make him do something. Can we please get a wild card package with Pat Ricard taking the direct snap? I need my Pancake Pat t-shirt. I need to get that Pancake Pat t-shirt. Go ahead, James. Don't worry. And also, he's that Grubhub. Um, yeah, don't Pat steal Ricard. his blooming onion. <laughs> yeah. Don't I'm steal it. Door. That was a great story. That was a great story. Oh, man. Uh, he actually became the NFL leader of receptions and yards by a player over 300 pounds. So there you go. Little do snap. <laughs> Uh, so there was one other surprise in this game, right? And I'm just going to say it. Oh, Jesus. It's because we're fucking spoiled. Uh, yeah. You think? A certain, Everybody's a certain one sitting over there on the couch 
was real <laughs> upset. <laughs> <laughs> Justin <laughs> Justin Tucker's not a machine apparently. He oh. can actually miss kicks. And Justin Tucker was ready to cut him or I mean Drew was ready to cut him. No, <laughs> yeah. Not exactly true. <laughs> you were I, ready to cut him. You I, were, I, uh, he's done. I was worried. Bring in Cook. That was one of those things where you saw him or right, the Where's Medvick? All world kicker. All of a sudden now he ain't making a field goal. He's human. Game. He's not a machine. What? He's human. Hey, He's I still no. I'm this I, guy has missed, missed what three kicks in in the past three years, but yet he is the he is still by far. I want to say, and somebody might have to look it up. I want to say it's at least it is at least by ten to fifteen percent one of the best kickers in the league in history. Yeah, by ten to fifteen, <laughs> not just in the league. We're historically talking, right. We're talking. Hundreds upon hundreds. This guy has has hit and got you. And I, somebody look it up to figure out how many points he's got us this year. Because if it's, it's the same 40, number as every other year, it's, if, if it's, it's forty one, it's, it's gotta 41, be. It's uh, like, like it's like six years in a row at this point. It's gotta right. be. It's one hundred and forty one. But you know how good <laughs> Justin Tucker is. You know how good Justin Tucker is. The Bears should take. Over. He let that shit go and came out there and kicked a fifty something yarder, fifty one yards, just a couple plays later. <laughs> it was fifty one yards the yeah. next drive, and it's <laughs> same uh, game. So uh, Mark, Mark has some words for you, Drew. He says you go kick a fifty one yard attempt. <laughs> <laughs> Look at Drew defending no. himself in the no. chat room. Hell no. No. Because then I got cut off here, too. Then don't listen to them, people. I, uh, you see no. how red he's turning? Yeah. He's like you want to kiss you off. white behind him, so it'll be fine. Yeah, yeah that, you wouldn't even see me. His it's face weird. is a mood ring. Wait, maybe all, we need to switch. We need to switch Drew and James so there's orange behind Drew. If I was at home, it'd be all eyebrows and baseball caps. Hey, uh, a couple people on YouTube brought this up to Mark, and I can't see the other guy who brought it up on YouTube. I want to give him credit. Go ahead and scroll down there, uh, Ryan. Uh, keep going. Uh, plant foot. That's up, other up, way. Up, up. Other it's the way. orange one. Other way. It's the orange one. Keep, keep going. going. Right there. there Steven. Go. Steven and Mark. His plant foot slid on that miss. Just a and little he still bit. still only missed by a foot left. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> exactly. That would have been. And in... they were on that side of the. They were on that hash mark, too. Right. Right. They were on that side of the hash mark. Also, so it's, the, reason like, I, the reason I wasn't worried about it is because of his response. Like. We were worried about people getting in their heads. We saw we saw Andrews getting in his own head. We saw Lamar get in his own head as the chief. When he missed that field goal, he was just like, hmm, that's yeah. interesting. Like, yes. That's what it looked like. A this little bit. But he, it, if you watch the replay when they first cut to him, he, he, had, his, he had those wide eyes, kind of like, like he did in that New Orleans game where he missed the extra point. Oh, shit. And his eyes were like, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> yeah. Like He had that reaction to a 50-something yard field goal miss yeah. that he missed by a foot. Didn't his foot slide on that one, too? I don't even know. No, I think that was the wind. He got up, and then all of a sudden the wind hit it, and it went boom, and it was my jinx because I said, hey, your boy better not miss yeah, this fucking kick, and then he missed fault. it. And Drew's over here saying he probably have, should have better cleats. I had, <laughs> I had a Steelers fan sitting <laughs> next to me and said he never misses this right before that happened this week. So <laughs> all right. I know all right. jinx was this week. So we haven't done this in a while. Scott, I'll let you start. We're going to give out our Ooh. game balls for this game before we break down this Bills game. Who are you giving? You give one player. One player. A game ball. Who are you giving it to? Um, we brought his name up a as the unsung hero, and I got I got to stick with it because he he was to your point all over the field. I think he made the biggest impact on that defense. If he's not there, if he's not on the field, I don't know that this game goes the way that it did because he was that much of an effect. So I got to go. My game ball, Pernell McPhee. I think he's the guy that that he helped us get this win. If he's not there, it's we we win this game by one touchdown. If he's not there. <laughs> Derrick Henry breaks off one touchdown. I don't know that we're. I, I, it could be to put a bit of a loss in overtime again. Drew, game ball. Who are you giving it to? Oh, go to James. All first. right, James. Game ball. Who are you giving it to? I'm giving it to the whole defense. They okay. did a hell of a okay. job to stop Derrick Henry, a 2,000 yard rusher. They played the hell of a game, so I'm giving it to, to the whole defense. Okay. Fair enough. Drew, game ball. I'm giving it to the Titans. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Listen, listen. listen. I'm as like, fast as you became a member of this show, I will throw you the fuck out. This is why I'm the youngest kid of three boys, and I never get to fucking finish conversation. <laughs> I'm giving it to the Titans grounds crew for painting that beautiful logo. There it is. For my boy, Marcus Peters, to take a pick, get all of us, get get us whole gang together, go stop on that logo, oh, we're a gang and get now. the shit back. For what they got. We're a gang now. <laughs> 
<laughs> Throw it to Scott. All right, oh, go ahead, Ryan. Right. Who's your game ball going to? Uh, you know, I got to give it to Pancake Pat. Pat there Ricard. It is. Okay. I mean, they were game planning for a lot of people. They were game planning from Lamar. And on the planned runs, he didn't look as good as he has against other teams. They were game planning for JK. He looked pretty good, but it wasn't what we kind of expected. Andrews wasn't there. But they weren't game planning for Pat Ricard to have, what, seven catches or something crazy? <laughs> that was not what they were game planning for. And that's why he's got my game ball for stepping up. All right, I like it. So I'm going to go kind of where James went, but uh, I'm going to give this to Wink. I think okay. Wink Martindale doing what he did to scheme that defensive up. There's there's so many game balls that could be given around on both sides, offensively and Greg Roman for sticking to the game. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, you really could. You could do this all day long. But I think Wink Martindale, to be able to put up that kind of performance to get his defense ready for a game like this on the road, in a rivalry, when all the chips are against you from the national media, yeah. big shout out to Wink. We got a bunch of people chiming in. I see uh, somebody giving it to Malcolm Butler. Uh, I, I think it. it was Mark says, uh, didn't Lamar outrush Henry and outpass Tannehill Beast? Absolutely. <laughs> Troy McPhee made six tackles on only 20, uh, 20 snaps. Impressive there. Uh, and then, Mark, I know you put it up earlier, says game ball to Vrabel for kick for taking on fourth and two. That's on the best one. <laughs> Hands down, best game ball right there. All right, so this this conversation could go very long, and I'm not, I don't want you guys to go very long. I want you guys to give a quick synopsis. We haven't talked about it yet, right? Obviously, the, the, the big uh, question mark at the end of the game, was it, was it appropriate for the Ravens to go out to the logo and do what they did after that game considering everything that it kind of led up to it. I'll let you start, Scott. I said from the get-go when the Titans did it, whatever, you should have showed them up on the field. Right. This time they did. Right. This time they came back and showed what it meant. Not only did you stomp on our turf, but you whooped our ass the last time in overtime. Right. Even though it was by one score, you whooped our ass in overtime. You, you made us eat our own words. Right. This time, you made them eat their own words. They were running their mouth all week. Malcolm Butler continued to run his mouth. You sat back. And that's where I do give Marcus Peters credit. We didn't hear much out of Marcus Peters this week. All right. He was pretty tight-lipped, but he let it talk in the game. And that's what I love. I love to see it. Had no problem with it. And I love that all of the media is saying they don't have problems with it, including uh, Mark Viviano. I don't know if you heard this on the, the radio yesterday, was saying that he loved it because it allowed... A lot of you get that glimpse of the old NFL when trash talk used to be a little bit more allowed. And that's that's kind of where I'm going to go with this whole thing, too, is that this is a rivalry. It goes back a long time, right? I, I said this earlier. This goes back to the late 90s, early 2000s. So this isn't something that just started overnight. Last year, this started with the disrespect from the Titans after they after they won the playoff game and they're mocking Mark Ingram and mocking Lamar after the playoff, you know, after the game was over. Right. Uh, and then they come out and do their logo thing uh, at the beginning of the regular season game this year. I didn't have a problem with any of that. If you start removing this stuff from the game, you start taking the fun away from these game from this game. That, there's nothing, you know, disrespectful about it. It's just Show up, play your game, win your game, and you know what? If you want to showboat a little bit about it at the end, cool. That's why I was all for like the touchdown celebration. When the NFL finally went relaxed on the touchdown celebration, they let these guys have fun. This is fun. Yeah. My my only thing, my only thing about the whole thing is when it comes to uh like the taunting call at the end. That was one thing. Thank you, James. <laughs> that was that was one thing. James is crawling over the floor to give me. If a you shot. only could it. see what I saw, <laughs> um, I, the one thing I would say is, if you're going to give that a taunting call, I get why because it's directly against the rules. Then there needs to be a look that if you're going to make a call like that in a game, you have to start looking at what's happening before these games, right? Right, and after these games, you if you're going to talk, that's basically conduct, right? A taunting call is conduct, right? So for me, if you're going to do that. You got to look at before the game. There needs to be a penalty for what happens before a game or after a game. Otherwise, just let it be. There's all these celebrations after a damn first down anyway or a sack. What the hell is the difference? I guess maybe the whole defense coming out on the field is a problem, but. And people that weren't playing coming onto the field to celebrate might have been a, a step. All right. Maybe. Well, then I'll go to you guys. Peanut Gallery. Nope. How did you guys feel about it? I, I, two ways. I'm with I'm with with Ryan saying when you got too many the whole like a team that uh, showing up on the logo and it's and players that aren't even on you know on the field at the time that's a little bit of a stretch but for me that's not any different than every single time 
it's the middle of the second quarter and someone takes a pick and the whole uh, you know eight or eight nine. Oh, the whole defense, defense goes down there. Yeah, and they go so stand the in front of that little right. little monitor thing. It's not any different than the logo. No, if they gone and did that, then they wouldn't got taunting call. Right. So what's right. The, you know what's the difference at that point? Right. Yeah. Malcolm Butler acted like a complete jackass in this game, giving Lamar the finger and all that stuff too. So if you're gonna be mad at one thing, you got to be mad at. There's everybody gonna be a fine coming thing. out of that, I'm sure. James, what's your thoughts? I really don't care because it's like what. Um, chalk that's sprayed on there that on their logo like if it was like turf and like you walk on it people run on that shit through the game anyways like who who gives a shit like i really don't care if it's something like in the stadium or a statue or something but it's a logo people run on that shit through the game so i really don't care all right ryan what do you got yeah i mean i i'm okay with the penalty because i get why it's called again the extra people running on the field but i'm also okay with them doing it like you can decide a penalty is worth it right that's part of the game you told me what the punishment is i'm gonna take it and i'm gonna do this because it's worth it for me yeah. so i'm good with both ways i think that if butler hadn't been talking shit all day and give him lamar the finger and stuff maybe you don't retribute for what happened last game right but when you that happened last game and they keep doing it this game I'm cool with it. I don't understand yeah. why everybody's blowing it. Blowing I think the other the other thing that's that's here too is this is a different scenario. We're, we would all probably be talking about this differently if this happened if this interception happened in the fir in the first quarter, right? right? Because now oh, you have an yes. effect on the rest of the oh, game. Oh, that's that's totally different. But right. right, that's what I'm saying. So that that plays another factor into how all of us feel about it. Because John Harbaugh would have been a lot more pissed <laughs> off. <than laughs> exactly. <that. laughs> I was honestly surprised we didn't see John Harbaugh go out and right. stop on the and you you talk about worth it penalties, right? Well, I don't know if you saw this after the game, but. One of the most worth it finds somebody's ever going to get that I saw after the game was the photo of Jihad Ward giving, giving the, the finger, double the middle <laughs> finger up to a couple of hecklers up in the stands. Uh, if you're ever going to get a fine for something, that was well worth it. And he's got a photo that he could probably hang in his man cave. I, for the rest I just of realized, if don't go away from for Fred for a second, it looks like Lamar is giving the middle finger. It does. Well, perfectly. Count them fingers. <laughs> well, fine. well set up that way. <laughs> oh, man. No. All right. So before we break down this Bills game, Ryan, it's time for you to shine. Let's give a social media shout out there. There's been a lot of comments out there. There's been a lot of people chiming in. Who do we got? All right, we do have a lot. Chuck Summers, Stephen Morris, Joe Shipley, Dwayne Jones, Jason, Ryan. Dwayne Jones. <laughs> Evan, Joe Carlozo, Jay Jax, uh, Travis, Stephen, Nick, Kamal, Sherry, Sharon Sherry, Alex, Joshua, Drunk Duck, best name of the day. Drunk hey, Duck. Drunk Duck. Garnet like West, it. Kaylee, Melvin, uh, Craig Zero, Dominic, J-Man, Days, Mabster, and Mark Ballert. And if I missed you, sorry. I tried to get everybody. Party sisters. We did. Were there any good comments out there that, that we hadn't talked about or anything that you wanted to bring up or maybe you want to do that later in the show or anything? Oh, and I think I've been throwing them all up. I've been doing a good job posting them right underneath you guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, keep them coming. It's all funny. I'm trying I, to give you guys your uh, due. This two wrongs don't make a right, but makes it even by Garnett West. The last thing that had me chuckling. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's let's talk about this game, man. We got the uh, next up divisional round of the playoffs. Ravens take a trip up to New York, take on the Buffalo Bills. Eight o'clock game Saturday night, prime time. They're saying twenty degrees. They're saying twenty mile an hour winds. They're saying potential snow. There's a whole lot of factors going on, and everything that I just said right there. Which is also How why you I think, feeling. I mean, it's the reason Buffalo is favored by two and a half right now. Uh, the over I'll take it. Let's be the underdog. I'm I'll honestly, I'm surprised at the over under on this game. In all okay. reality, because the over, with all of those things, the over under is fifty. At least when I pulled it yesterday. Right. So if unless it's changed, and you guys might be able to look into that and see if it's changed, but the over under being at fifty right now. I'm taking the under in this game with all those weather factors. Okay. Right. I think this is this is going to be a game. This would be a game. If you're going through the air, it's going to be a game to test. Uh, you're going to be testing Allen in that weather, especially if it's snow for him. Right. Right. You're going to be testing that that connection with Diggs. But on the flip side of that, if that's the weather, please make sure Lamar has the right cleats on. <laughs> okay. Please. That's true. Somebody, somebody true. have the cleats and tell Lamar it's not working. Change them now, like after the first drive. That's true. Go ahead, Ryan. I think please more wind. 
the more wind, the better, because I am most scared of the Diggs Allen connection. I'm not scared of the running backs at all. I'm only a little bit scared of running Josh. backs. It's not even plural at this point. They <laughs> lost Moss the other day. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, well, they didn't have all running back in my mind because they were all just kind of sharing, and they were all mediocre. Right. So now they have one mediocre running back. I'm not worried about that. You're worried a little bit about Josh Allen running the ball, whatever. If, if it gives that 20 miles an hour, if I get 30 miles an hour, lock that Ravens win. Yeah, yeah. this team, Buffalo Bills, struggled with the Indianapolis Colts in their first round of the playoffs, a game that I didn't expect to be much of a game at all, really. And that's not any shot at the Colts. It's more so how good I thought the Buffalo Bills were. And I was saying they're not. Uh, It's just I didn't expect that game to be close. What I did see in this game, uh, talking about the Colts game, uh, was a very active Josh Allen with his legs. And I said this in the, the group chat. Josh Allen reminds me of a more athletic Ben Roethlisberger. He's yeah. got the size. He's got the arm. Uh, early on, believe it or not, in Ben Roethlisberger's career, he was mobile. Not quite as mobile as Josh Allen is. That's why I say I think he's the better athlete overall. Yeah. But he's one of those guys that it takes three, four, five guys to bring him down because he's got tree trunks for legs, and he's like, what, 6'6 six, six or 6'7 six, or something? He's huge. Yeah, he. I mean, he he's a big guy. He's he's got good vision down the field, both you know when it comes to you know finding the open man or or even throwing his man open to that to that extent with the with Diggs as he has it on occasion, right. been able to throw him open. Uh, but then the vision and ability to adjust downfield. He he's that good mix. He's not. He doesn't have quite all of the skill set and the shiftiness that Lamar and the breakaway speed that Lamar does, but he does have the vision to find the hole when he needs it. Right. right? And at times get out of the pocket. We've seen that the past three weeks. He's done it a little bit more and been a little bit more effective with it that he gets out. He finds he finds the hole. He gets eight, ten yards and it you know winds up getting them a first down when they really, really need it. You saw that a few times in this game. But I think the connections just weren't there um, as much as we've seen in the past. Uh, you know, he goes 26 for 35, 324 yards still. Still <laughs> impressive. Yeah, pretty right? damn good game. Still still a pretty good game, but it's it's one of those things. A lot of that was to Diggs. I think Diggs had like 130 yards or something like that in this yeah. game. Diggs is, Diggs is a problem. Diggs is a true number yeah. one receiver. A guy that I wish was here in purple. Unfortunately, we spent money on the defensive side, and we didn't have the money to go out and get a true number one. It is what it is. He's yeah. doing big things up there in Buffalo, and he's going to be a problem. That's, it's going to be interesting to see how and who the Ravens shadow digs with will it be marlon humphrey like they did with with him over aj brown will it be you know a a, a marcus peters a guy that's going to take some gambles and some risks do you do that against the digs i don't know it'll be interesting to see what they do with him uh but the wind i don't think is going to be as much of a factor as everybody's playing it up to be it's 20 mile an hour wins right josh allen has an absolute hose an absolute hose. And he can throw through that wind. I, I don't see that being a, a, a big problem. Uh, so, again, the biggest part of this game that we got we to gotta stop, in my opinion, is going to be Josh Allen with his legs. It's not the running back. It's not Singletary. Singletary doesn't concern me. No. It's Josh Allen's legs. And if there's any defense <laughs> that knows how to stop a mobile quarterback, it's the guy that I'm going to say it's the defense that practices against the best one in the league. The Ravens. So this is why I'm pretty confident going into this game. Peanut Gallery, Drew, James, how you guys feeling on this, Drew? I'll let you start. Yeah, that that's Diggs is my biggest worry. I, I don't I everything you you guys have said as as literally all I can think of with this team. But for me, it's it's it goes back to everything we say. It's run the damn ball because mm-hmm. The, the Bills do have issues with stopping. Oh yeah, that. they're yeah. one of the worst teams against the run and tight ends. Right. So, you know, I mean, that's, you know, your two strengths is running the ball, and if he's not dropping the ball, catching, you know, the tight end work. So, yeah, that's all I can add. Okay. James, what do you got? I'm all, I'm all for it um, with, uh, you know, sticking to the game plan. I think the win will help us because maybe we'll stick to the script of running the ball, pounding the ball, keep Josh Allen off the field. Uh, Josh Allen off the field means less connection to digs. I think – I'd rather see Peters on Diggs than Humphreys because I don't think he, Humphreys can hang with Diggs. Um, but we'll see. But I, I like it. Like I said, we uh, control Josh Allen. We control the game. Right. The defense, I'm not worried about. Just run the ball, maybe more Dobbins, and you know, get the win. We'll talk about the offense here in a second. Ryan, how are you feeling about this? I'm feeling pretty good. Um, 
again, Diggs, you know, I respect every inch of that man. Uh, he, he's he's going to be real hard to stop. Every uh, inch. Every inch. That was <laughs> dirty. Um, you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> but no, but again, it's, it's, it's this man's been playing with a so linebacker big. as his quarterback. Then he went out there to overrated Kirk Cousins. Josh Allen is way better than anyone he's ever played with, and it's showing. He's yeah. showing exactly what his talents were, uh, and – I'm a little scared. The other thing is, I don't know who this Davis cat is that just showed up out of nowhere. You see that wide receiver Davis yeah, this week? Yeah. I had no idea who he was, but that that's somebody to look out for, too. Like, I thought Beasley was that second option, but not last week. That was Davis. Cole Beasley, in, in fairness, is the number two option there. And Cole Beasley is a damn good wide receiver. He's banged up right now. Yeah. So how healthy will he be? He's still going to be a factor. He was still out there playing. You know, he's still, you know, a guy that you have to manage out of the slot. Uh, you know, and it'll be interesting to see what the Ravens do with him because he's a, a quick wide receiver. He's a shifty wide receiver. Uh, and if you're going to put Marlon Humphrey out on the edge against, you know, Stefan yeah. Diggs, who are you going to play in the in the slot there against Beasley? My, my only my only worry with all of this on the defensive side of the ball, right? We're talking about who's going to cover Beasley. Who's gonna... We just got done a physical game with the Titans. Yeah. Right. Are we going to be 100%, right? Because you never know the, the small soft tissue injuries, the aches, the pains that come after a game like that, right? When it's a hard-fought game, we saw big hit Elliott, you know, make another big hit in this game, he did. right? So it's when you get a physical game like this and you still, you know, Henry, Henry didn't like let up on his runs, right? right. He was trying. We know he's trying because he wants to make it in the playoffs just as, as much as everybody else. But we were being physical and stop him. So what toll did that take on the defense? That's that's one of my bigger worries, too, is is what toll did that take? Because I, I'm worried about that defensive front. Yes, I, I know that we can stop the run, but how banged up are they coming off the, the stopping of Henry? How 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 physical of the, of the game that we saw in the secondary? How does that play a, a role into what the, the uh, cornerbacks... Yeah. are doing the defensive backs. I, I'm just, that's what gets me on edge. I get you. I mean, there's definitely going to be some bumps and bruises, but I will say this. We came out of that game relatively healthy. Oh, we didn't we, have no, any, no, we didn't no, have no any big about injuries it. or anything like that. Both teams are going to be dealing with the same thing as far as, you know, having the, the normal bumps and bruises going through a playoff. But I'm telling you, this team just seems to be laser focused right now. They all seem to be playing collective together as a unit, uh, which is what you want at this time. They're really, really hitting their stride. Uh, but all right, let's let's switch to the offensive side, right? We talk about Josh Allen and and how to defend him. Well, the Buffalo Bills have got to figure out a way to stop Lamar Jackson, Jackson, J.K. Dobbins, this ground attack, which they have not been able to stop all year. No, I mean, the, look at look at Indy, right? Indy doesn't have the big the biggest or best rushing game in the league. No, right? Not even close. They're they're middle of the road, and they were able to put up 163 yards mm -hmm. on this. Double that. Right, and that's where I was going. Yeah. I think this could be another game where you see it's not going to be the 400 yards, but I wouldn't be surprised to see close to 300 rushing yeah. in this game. And run, it, run, run, run until run until they stop you twice. Yep, yep. twice. And if it's right. snowing, once is an accident. If it's snowing with with some of the balls that Lamar throws up there, that kind of not lollipop throws, but tend to hang a little bit. You know, take time. You get a little to get more hang there. time. Yeah. You don't want those types of throws. Those are going to be the balls that are going to be easily picked. You're going to have to succeed in this game on the ground, and I, I like the advantage of our offensive line versus their defensive front. Drew, what do you see in this game? How do you think the uh, the Ravens go to attack here? I, I, everything you guys, I don't really have much to say. Yeah, I, to me, if, if, if weather is a factor, I don't want him doing a lot of, of, of throwing – downfield if right. you've got too much wind that is my worry because i mean it wasn't super windy in tennessee and you you threw a you know you threw the eye interception like you did before so i think it, it comes down to what you're used to seeing out of him anyway those short throws and and if a game is gonna go you know be a weather game like that then that's not too bad of a strategy still yeah. And Garnett, to your point, he says Indianapolis had two great running backs, but they dropped the ball consistently. I, I get it. Like, they're, they're rookie running back, Jonathan Taylor. They got Nakeem Himes there. I think they're good running backs, but I'll put J.K. Dobbins, Gus Edwards up against them all day all long. All day long. And that's not even considering the X factor of Lamar Jackson, who Lamar ran for over 100 yards against a much better defensive front right. this past week. Yeah. Ryan, what do you see happening in this game? If there's significant snow... I don't want Lamar running as much. I want. 
I don't think they're saying it's supposed to be significant. Okay. It's supposed it's supposed to be enough to be annoying. If it's a if I'm it's hearing. a dusting, you leave it as is. If it ends up being significant snow, Drew's not gonna like this. But you gotta find a way to get Mark Ingram back on that roster. You gotta have somebody He that wasn't can, even active this week. I know, but I'm saying you just gotta you gotta you gotta to find a way to get him in there if it's going to be you know, four inches or more because you need to be able to get three yards and a, a lot pile. Of inch talk in this show. What? All out of him too. <laughs> Wait, hold on. A lot though. of short inches. <laughs> what, what Four Ingram inches. Bring, what does Ingram bring better than the other two? I'm, what I'm, what Is that I'm, what Gus Edwards does, though? What I, no, yes, you will see Gus Edwards. But what He's I'm saying, saying is you're, re, you're basically removing Lamar from the from the equation in, in my head in that. You're, there's four you're to still six keeping inches of snow. Gotcha. You're not gotcha. running Lamar, like, at all. Like, he'll only run on, on break-down passing plays. So you replace Lamar's yardage or some of it with Ingram, and the other two also take steps up. Or with Pat Ricard. I, oh, I, yes, <laughs> yes. He could push a pile three yards. You're right. We, we don't, just, we don't sorry. need him, but I think if yeah. you can, because you also need extra cornerback depth with digs out there. So, so it's going to be difficult. You're saying have J.K. Dobbins, Gus Edwards, and Mark Ingram all active. All active. Who are you taking snap count away from? I don't know if it's possible. That's what I said. If you can get it, say there's a lineman you can drop. This week well, they we were, can make it work. So we, this week we were hamstrung because we had to carry both punters. So we had we had the punter when Cook was out a week, right. and you had to carry him an extra week because he was on the practice squad, and otherwise you lost it. So it was just like this paper punter that we knew wasn't going to play, but he had to be on the active roster. So if that's the spot that gets you Mark Ingram back, great. If you need it for an extra corner or whatever, fine. Like we can get through the game with the running backs we have, but I don't see Lamar doing any planned runs if you have deep snow because it's too risky. Like it's, yeah. it's just too risky to get him hurt because his cuts that are great on a normal day, I don't want to see him try to make in six to eight inches of snow. And to Garnett's point out there, you said it, you took my words right out of my mouth. Let Gus bus. Yeah, yeah. Gus, let that Gus guy is- north, south. Get those three, four, five yard carries, run it down their fucking throats, yeah. and have J.K. Dobbins out there as that third down well, change of pace back that can catch the ball out of the back. I don't know if you need Justice Hill. I know he plays special teams, but how much speed do you really need if there's eight inches of snow? So that might be the spot you can drop it off of. I don't know. That's true. I, I, it's it's true. I think I think Hill though plays a little bit more of a of a role on that that special teams, and he's if he's already in good graces with with Harbaugh on the special teams. I know he had the. The one penalty that Harbaugh was not happy with him on, but I don't know that he's the guy that you're dropping. I I do see your point though, and I agree with you that overall, I don't agree that Ingram should be active. I think you need to stay away from him unless you absolutely need him. And the way that you do that is you don't design the runs for Lamar to run. If Lamar gets loose and breaks loose, let him, let him. I don't care. That's I want Mark Ingram on the sideline with some pom poms in his hand. That's what I want to see. I don't want right. him in the lineup. I don't want him out there. I'd much rather have Justice Hill as an option because at least you're going to get usage out of him on special teams, and he is an effective special teamer. Yeah. And I think he'd be okay playing out there in the snow. And if you're going to run the risk of injury to anybody, I'm okay with running the risk on Justice Hill. Just Drew, my opinion. Drew and James, last words on this before we move on. Real quick, uh, Joe Joe needs to listen all the time. He said, make sure Lamar has better cleats, but you already said that, Scott. Yeah. But anyway, Start it that way. Let, Joe. Let, let Lamar just be Lamar. Don't change anything up. I don't know anybody who doesn't like playing the snow. Right. Like, it's fun. Yeah. You remember Smear the... You know, yeah, that game out yeah. in the snow was a whole lot of fun. Yeah, like, I, I think he'll be fine wherever they but leave Ingram. He can like pom poms or whatever. Get the get the hot chocolate ready. I, I don't. I don't care. I can be wrong. I've just. just I've. I have other weeks have said leave Ingram off the roster, and I think Justice Hill is very valuable. I just eight inches of snow or more. I start thinking the. Here opposite we go direction. with the inches again. Yeah. <laughs> What do you want me to call snow? Three quarters of a foot of snow? What do you need? What's, what have you eight seen? Inch, eight what, inches in Buffalo is nothing. What have you seen out of Mark Ingram but eight inch runs? Like, we haven't seen anything good from Mark Ingram this year. That's it. Like that just, And that's in dry conditions. He feels like a slow, short yardage back, push the pile, keep it moving. I have feet so much. You, no cuts. I, right. I have so much respect for him, and I love Mark Ingram, the man, and I loved him last year. But it, father time, father time, yeah. like you just got to move on. We have better options. All right, Drew, last it's the fucking playoffs. Drew, last last comment before we move on. He's, He's pissed good. about the inch. If I see Ingram, 
uh, with a carry, I'm not watching the rest of that game. <laughs> <laughs> I think Ingram sent. No, I really sent, want one. I think Ingram sent Ryan a tweet like, "Hey, talk he about me, me this week. Yeah. I haven't heard anything on Birdland BS." Right. <laughs> this segment sponsored by Mark Ingram. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> oh, all right, man. All right, so let's keep it rolling. Let's get into these predictions, these playoff predictions. We're going to start with this Ravens game. But, Scott, I'll let you go ahead, toot your own horn a little bit because I know you want to. It's like the only time you can this entire year. Go ahead. Hey, tell I, everybody how good you did this week. I, I had to say I was within, I was within three. I got to pick to click. So, you did. So the, the, new, the new standings are in the playoffs. There's, one, there's been one pick to click week, week in the playoffs, and I'm leading. I can say that for <laughs> And once. you messed up a score He had already. to create a whole other section of wins All and I, losses just so but, he could feel but good but about it. He did himself. mess up a score uh, record. Brian doesn't have four and one record. There's six games. Oh, uh, There's a formula there. So he's four and two. He's four and two on that. Yeah. So I'll I'll fix that. All of the other ones were fixed, but yes. All right. So last week it's I went, a formula that has to get fucked up because Drew wanted Drew complained him whoa, enough whoa. that we had to get him in, added wow. in. F bomb. <laughs> well, for those of those listening in the chat, this is Drew's last episode. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going out in the blaze of glory at some point in the next couple minutes. Oh, all right. Man. So Scott, Ryan, Drew all go five and one last week with their picks. Me, James, and Brian all go four and two with our picks last week. So not a bad week overall for all no. of us combined. Uh, but all right, let's start with this this Ravens Bill game, eight fifteen Saturday night. We've already talked about it. We've already diagnosed it. How do you see it shaking out? It's under the lights. I'm. I, I do have worries. I think uh, I. I look at this and I say it's going to be a close game. It's going to come down to one possession. It's going to come down to Justin Tucker in this game. He's going to make. He's going to make one from long and redeem himself. And he's going to show Drew to shut the hell up. And he's uh, still the best kicker in the league. It's 30 to 27 Ravens for me. We'll pass it over to Ryan. What do you got? All right. I have a very similar score. 35, 31 Ravens. Like you said, we're it's, it's going to be close. They're a very talented squad. I just think that I just think we get it done with the run game. I think we can. And, and, and somehow we need to rein in digs, whether we double triple team. I don't care. Okay. okay. Fair enough. James, what do you got going on in this game? I have this game pretty uh, pretty much uh, built 37-24. You guys are like, you know, what's going on? I'm saying uh, Lamar Lamar hasn't really showed up for primetime night games, and this is a playoff game at night. So Here we go, Stephen A. again. <laughs> I'm just saying he, he can't show up at primetime night games, and after this, if they can get a win – I'll move differently. You know what, James? You've been picking against the Ravens the past few weeks. You keep on doing yeah, it. Yeah, I'm fine with it. So what do you got? What's the score? I have the score of the Bills 37-24. All right. And that's how it's going to be. If there's anybody in here that I'm happy you picked the Bills, it's you. <laughs> Drew, <laughs> what do you got? I'm changing the score that I put. Um, <laughs> Justin Tucker's missing a field goal in overtime. No, uh, let me stop I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> Don't listen to these people. I didn't rag on Tucker that bad. Uh, 30, 30, uh, 30 to 24 Ravens in overtime <laughs> with a, look, J.K. Dobbins, not Mark Ingram, <laughs> with a like a 20 yard run, like. A la Derrick Henry in the game this season. I I have Ravens. He's game. going super like prediction here. Yeah, right. He's got real particular. I'm going down in a blaze of glory today. I'm just going. All right. Uh, so before we, before you give yours, Fred, uh, Brian apparently is smoking the same stuff that James is uh, picking the Bills again. Twenty seven seventeen. All right. In this game, let's hone it into the pick that actually matters. You know, the one that you guys all care about <laughs> out there. It's mine, right? The, the Bills, the Ravens. I think, to Drew's point, it's going to be a very close game. This could go to overtime, especially with uh, the weather being a factor that's, that's going to hamper, I think, both teams. I think this score I have right now might be even high for what this score will be because of the weather. Uh, but I do think that this is a back and forth game. I think. Lamar Jackson, regardless of what Ryan thinks, I think Lamar Jackson <laughs> runs the ball in this game. He clicks close to 100 yards. But I think the MVP of this game is going to be Mark Andrews. The, the, the Buffalo Bills have had a, a tough time with tight ends, and I think Andrews is due. We've talked about yeah. some of the drop issues that he has. I think Lamar's going to want to get him involved. So will Greg Roman. I think Mark Andrews has 100 yards receiving in this game and has won maybe two touchdowns, including the game winner, I think Ravens win 33-31. I love the one that Ryan just put up. I, Joe Carlozo said I heard Tucker taking Drew's place next week. <laughs> I Justin love it. Tucker couldn't hold my jock in this room, all right? <laughs> <laughs> 
Tucker. I love Tucker. I'm sorry. Stop you, it. Stop you, it. Could, you couldn't hold his Royal Farms coffee. Oh, man, you are live. <laughs> you are live on multiple media platforms right now, Drew. <laughs> Tucker could do this whole show in opera. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Oh, all right, man. all right. So let's get into this next game. Saturday, four thirty-five on Fox. The Rams. I think the one team out of all of the teams that have advanced to the playoffs that nobody. Well, I say nobody expected. They're the biggest. There might have been one surprise. or two people in here that picked the Rams. <laughs> Put your hand down, Drew. There might have been a couple people that liked the Rams, uh, but the Rams going into Green Bay. Talk about cold. <laughs> You got a quarterback in, in Jared Goff who's dealing with, you know, a hand injury. He just got surgery like two and a half weeks ago. Uh, I don't think that this matchup goes very well for the Rams. I understand Rams have a good defense. Aaron Donald is a problem, and you always got to factor in, you know, him into the equation at all times. Aaron Rodgers playing on a whole nother level right now. I think the Packers win this one pretty easily. I've got them winning 34 24. I don't know that. I don't know that. Any, I think we're all in agreement in the room. I don't know that there's much that the Aaron Rodgers and this offense can't do right now um, and, and against anybody. Look, Aaron Donald looked a little banged up in that last last game, mm. right? He's he, Who knows how healthy he's going to be for this game against the top, arguably the top offense in the NFL this year, right? I don't know that there's a whole lot to be said. I've got them winning this game by more than one score. I've got it being 30 to 21 in favor of the Packers. Drew, what do you got? I, on, on Donald, he does. I mean, they're saying he's playing, but they, he did tear rib cartilage. Yeah. Okay. Or tear, whatever the. I'm not a medical expert. In, Neither am I. <laughs> I'm just a field goal expert. In the just, just the closest we have. <laughs> uh, I beat up old crazy people for a living. <laughs> I got uh, Packers 27, Rams 13. Uh, it's just, I think Aaron Rodgers has something to prove this year. Yeah. And I, I I, really, yeah, he's not going to, you know, disappear. So, yeah. Right. Okay. James, what do you got? Well, if I'm going to go with uh, Ryan on this, there'll probably be 12 inches of snow, and Aaron Rodgers is probably great in the snow because that's what he, he does doesn't best. run. That's why and, he's good uh, in the snow. <laughs> Hey, he can he has he can plant pretty well, so he must have good uh, equipment over there. But uh, I had the Packers winning this forty-one twenty-three. Uh, he's he's going to just do his thing, and that's all it is. All right, Brian's got this Packers thirty to ten. Ryan, what do you got? How many inches are Aaron Rodgers' cleats? Oh Jesus! <laughs> so much so inch four. Talk. So, four inches. Four, those are great. Those are great cleats. <laughs> um, <laughs> so no, I think that the Rams' defense is awesome. They're going to slow down the Packers. They'll probably slow down the run game more than they will Aaron Rodgers because Aaron Rodgers is unstoppable 24 17 Packers win all right so moving right along we're gonna go into the Sunday game the 305 game Browns at the Chiefs CBS so hard to believe that the Browns are in the divisional round of the playoffs <sighs> look at how they came out the gate against the Steelers uh, you're right you're right if I'm if if I'm the GM I'm questioning Kevin Stefanski coming back this week because the special teams coach did a damn good job of play calling. This did week. you see the photo of the guy with like the hood on? He had the 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 Browns helmet on. They're like yeah. Kevin Stefanski snuck into the stadium. <laughs> yeah, right. Shit was absolutely hilarious. Uh, he might be a coaching job. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, he he very well made the way he the way he play called in that game. Uh, and I think I think they have something to prove this year. They did it against the Steelers. I think we saw a lot of offense in this game, and the Steelers defense is obviously, well, has been in the league one of the better defenses and better than the Chiefs defense. And I think because of that, the Browns have something to prove. They're going to put up some numbers. They're going to put up some points. I've got this being a close game, high-scoring game. If you're, if you're thinking, if you're looking at the over-under of 56, I'd bet the over here. I think, the, I think it's going to be a Browns win, 35 to 33 in this game. I think they're going to do enough to beat Pat Mahomes. Wow. Lay off the weed. <laughs> God, the Chiefs are one of the best teams in the NFL coming off of a bye. Like they put up 30, 40, 50 points a clip coming off buys. If you don't think Andy Reid and Co. is going to have this team ready to go and Pat Mahomes isn't chomping at the bit to take on fucking Baker Mayfield and the Browns, you're high. The, the Chiefs, I, I, listen, it's still going to be a good game. The Browns aren't a terrible team. They're playing good football, right? And they just curb stomped the Steelers, especially in that first quarter. It was <laughs> god awful. They let off uh, the throttle in that game. That was their problem. Yeah, but then, I mean, the Browns still were the Browns. They let the Steelers back into that game, right? So 
I think the, the Chiefs will win this game. Uh, they'll win it by a, a touchdown. I've got them winning 37-30 to 30 in this game. Drew, what do you got? Look, the Chiefs had issues last year with that Houston game. Remember, they were down 24 nothing, and they came back and, did, you know, I mean, well, Houston ended up scoring, but they what, it was like seven or eight straight drives that the Kansas City Chiefs scored on. So it's not – I don't see the Browns doing exactly what they did again. They could take their participation trophy and go home after this week. <laughs> I got it, uh, Chiefs 45 over 30. All, All right. right. James? Uh, I'm going to go with Ryan again. Um, probably going to be snowing up there probably. So <laughs> eight inches of snow. Jeez. And Patrick Mahone's probably not going to have good Adidas cleats. Um, so I'm gonna go He's only the, got them two inches. <laughs> I'm going to go with the Browns because he spent all his money on the ring for his uh, fiance. I'm going to go with the Browns, 33-27. What are you Nick, guys smoking? The weed. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go with the Browns, 33-27. Nick Chubbs. I think this is going to be the formula for them to beat the Chiefs um, and just keep Mahomes off the field. And they're going to win. And we're gonna, if it, if, Hey, and if the Browns and the Ravens meet for the divisional championship game, I mean, uh, AFC Championship games, it would be like... I mean, I would love it. I, 100%, I would love it. It will be at home. Brian's on that same train with you. He's got the Browns winning 30-28. to 28. You guys are ridiculous. Ryan, <laughs> please talk some sense into these people. I don't, I don't think it's going to be snowing. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> Uh, I got this as a shootout. Uh, How many got, inches are they going to win this game? They're going to win the inches <laughs> by a few inches here. Uh, 42-35. Uh, I think it's a shootout, but the Chiefs just got too much firepower. You're not going to knock no. them out in a one and done. Thank you. Thank you. We closed that segment with some some real talk, some knowledgeable talk. I mean, I'm the one that wanted Mark Ingram, yeah, so Lee. don't look at me. Yeah, we had to, yeah, we had to sandwich the shit in the middle there. Yeah. Well, you know, whatever. the person that picked the Browns beating the Steelers. Everybody, you got Drew over here like, oh, they don't have coaches. Like, uh, yeah. It looked like practice did them uh, Who, who a, picked the Rams, thing. Scott? Yeah, all right. <laughs> Move it on. Move <laughs> it right along. Uh, last game of the week. This is the 640, which I didn't get this, by the way. Wh why not just make this a damn prime time, a full prime time game and, and do it at 8 o'clock? Yeah, it's a weird time. It, it, do it at 640 on Fox. Uh, I guess maybe there's something having to do with NBC. Can't help. Yeah, they got to play more games a 10-year-old rerun of Friends. All right. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, Bucks at the Saints. Uh, this is... I know we, we, we sent it in the, the chat, the, the history. I think it was Fred. I think it was you that, that posted the history channel. Uh, one oh, it was that, great. That Tom, Tom Brady. And it was Tom Brady that put that out. Hilarious. <laughs> Considering they had the Nickelodeon game and then he posts like the history channel and the two of them, it was fucking right. classic. Tom Brady wins the internet. Like, yes. I, I love that guy on the internet. And everything great. else. Yeah. <laughs> and he's, six championships. Yeah. <laughs> he's he's a, well, uh, the, the, the Bucks at the Saints. So obviously going into New Orleans, uh, I, I think this is going to be the game of the week, which again is why I'm really surprised this wasn't a prime time game, you know, to to be in full prime time. But it's still obviously going to be a close game. It's going to be a shootout, as far as I'm concerned. I think both of these teams are going to put up good numbers. Now, granted, the Saints didn't have had some falling off, but we saw Michael Thomas be effective in this last game. I think he's going to come out in this game and have a good game, but I just don't know. I think Tom Brady is out to prove something, especially the fact that you have the Patriots didn't make it to the playoff. So it's not Belichick. It's Brady. It's his, his, his team. It's his guys. It's his connections. I see the Bucks winning this game 45-38 in a shootout. How great is this? This whole AFC versus NFC thing, right? Young versus old too. You got the new age versus the you know the the old vets, Young the Bucks old school guys. Yeah. You got Drew Brees. You got Tom Brady. You got Aaron Rodgers all in the NFC, and then you got everybody in the AFC that's like twenty five or younger. Go, it's just it's just crazy. It's a really Baker, cool Baker's concept. The oldest too, out of all of them. Yeah, yeah, Baker is the oldest man. That two thousand eighteen draft class is holding strong <laughs> as far as quarter uh, quarterback play, comparable to. I don't remember what year it was, but like you figure you had Ben Roethlisberger, uh, Phillip Rivers, and Eli Manning yeah. all drafted that same was year. Was it 98? Something like, no. Some, no, 98 was, was, like, was like Peyton Manning. Or something like that. I, I meant to say 98 with Peyton Manning. Peyton Manning. Draft too. Right, but yeah, Ryan, whatever his name was, Ryan Leaf sucked. Yeah, I'm just talking <laughs> about the class. That class was crazy. He's, I think I saw him on an episode of Where Is He Now? Yeah. <laughs> a hell of a drug addict counselor, apparently. When you own it as the biggest bust in the NFL... Oh yeah, <laughs> history. You are the biggest bust in NFL history. Yeah. It's Ryan Leaf. All right, so back to the Bucks and Saints. Uh, I think this is going to be a shootout. To your point, and this is who's running to their retirement check first, right? Uh, I, the Bucks are loaded. They got a ton of weapons. 
You know, they've got wide receivers galore down there sitting on the bench that are better than our starters. I mean, they've just got so many weapons. But it's Drew Brees, and Drew Brees has got his best target back in Michael Thomas. Alvin Kamara is probably the best football player in the NFL right now. I'd put him 1A and 1B with Lamar as far as their athletic ability. You can never discount Alvin Kamara when he's out there. I think the Saints pull it off just because of the continuity of them being together for a while. I get it. Tom Brady's looked good, and they've done big things. This will be a close game, but I think the Saints pull it off 38-32 to late. What do you got, Drew? I think Alvin Kamara just got another goal. <laughs> Um, I got it. Uh, it's hard. It's hard for teams to pull off a three and O over an opponent in a given year. Yeah. I mean, you look back this year and granted it's not one season, but this was the third matchup in a given year against the Titans. And we came out on top and if it, it, it fucking, it pains me to pick the bucks because I'm, I just want top ready to go away at this point, <laughs> but uh, I got a bucks 20 to 14 in overtime. <laughs> of course, in overtime. In overtime. It wouldn't, oh, be, it wouldn't overtime. be without James. We got. I tell you what, this is probably going to be the least favorable game to watch. I think it's going to be pretty boring. what, pretty what? boring, because Nickelodeon is not going to be. I, I I was surprised. I actually enjoyed the Nickelodeon. I thought it was kind of cool. It, it man. was. You know, it, was it was cool, cool it's especially great. for young kids. Yeah, you know, you can teach a lot. But I have a corny but game. cool. That's yeah. what you expect from Nickelodeon. Yeah. Uh, I have a close game, twenty-seven, twenty-four. I think it's going to be. Uh, Saints defense showing up, slowing down uh, Tom Brady and Drew Brees is just getting old and it's not going to be as, you know, down the field throwing for him. I, I think this is going to be like the most boring game out of all of them. Okay. So what do you got the score? I was, uh, 24. I mean, 27, 27, 24. Okay. He really is on the lead. <laughs> <laughs> Brian's got this game going the Saints 37, 24. Ryan, what do you got? All right, um, I'm picking the Bucks. I need the Bucks for lots of reasons. <laughs> I knew he was going there with this. <laughs> uh, for nope. the Bucks, I need to win the Bucks. And no snow um, down there. So twenty, <laughs> no snow. Absolutely no. You're in the dome or you're in Tampa. I don't care. Either way, no snow. Uh, it's gonna end the, up with a blizzard. The, the Bucks twenty eight twenty four. Um, I, yeah, I I don't know. I think Tom Brady can pull this off, and we're gonna see. I, and I do want to comment on the Nickelodeon thing. Just just yeah, a go for it, man. Yeah. I think they need to do one every week. I would prefer if they do the 4 o'clock game every week because you're going to get to watch the 1 o'clock game, and then wifey's around like, hey, let's get some stuff done. I'm like, no, I'm watching with the kids. I'm teaching them football. <laughs> That's what this <laughs> was like, designed let's, for. Let's, yeah. we're, we're teaching them the game. We're getting the next generation around. So please, 4 o'clock game every week, Nickelodeon, let's do it. And I'll put it, I'll put it on top of that, which because they didn't, they didn't really show it, and I don't think they showed anybody after the fact. Player of the game. Need, or the winning coach needs to be agreed to be slimed every time. It would gain a ton of attention. Didn't you see it? No, I didn't see yeah, it. Sean Payton got Did he slimed after the when, game. When I was watching it, they they were showing him talking with uh, the the one kid talking with uh, Jordan God, Cameron. Yeah. yeah, Jordan Cameron, and he was like, I don't know where Coach went. Da da da. So I turned it off. Nah, that point, they, so I didn't. I guess he I didn't was see it. he was in the tunnel in the doing tunnel. an interview, yeah. sitting down, like you know, sitting like almost Indian style. And they messed he up. He gave a little Jordan. like intro to it or whatever, and they hit him with a gallon uh, of the, the slime. I have to go look at it then. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So and, then, as long as they do that, I think it'd be great. Yeah. And, it, and it they got cool. uh, slime on his Jordans, dude. I was a little. I'm sure he'll get a new pair. I thought it was really cool, like when they were breaking down what the rules were yeah. why they were making the penalty calls and stuff it's it's really helpful that's i think it, it'd be good i do yeah agree that's young sheldon they used that's yeah. awesome yeah. all right scott it's time for the liquor stop brew of the week and what did jerry and the boys hook us up with this week this shit is delicious before you even say <laughs> so it is fucking fantastic every so <laughs> ryan had this like pre-show he took a sip of it and his reaction we were all like is it good or bad like, is it good or bad? And he loved it. He's like, this shit's amazing. So this is from Founders Brewing Company. It's actually out of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, this is called Robas. So this is their pure raspberry ale. I never realized how much of a raspberry fan I was. This is the second raspberry beer you've <laughs> this is like liked. The second or third raspberry beer that we've had, and I've absolutely loved all yeah. of them. So it's 5.7, so it's actually pretty light. Uh, it's they in their words, optimizing the flavor of fresh raspberries. Robos is founder's way of celebrating joys of summer year round. The stunning berry, berry red masterpiece, which it does pour red, by the way, is a perfect blend of sweet, tart and refreshing. 
Robots defies subtly and proves to be the perfect accompaniment to those long days, no matter what the season, with a friend by your side and an adventure out in front of you. Enjoy your year-round robots. Delicious. This is this stuff is good. This it's, stuff is really good. And it's not when they say tart. Like we've had some tart beers on the show. Yeah, we've had some, this. Some, this is yeah. I, I'm not a. You're tart not a fan. tart person. I'm not, but I am absolutely a raspberry well, fan. Well, your personality may be tart, but <laughs> you're robust. <laughs> yes, very robust. Uh, I, I no, I love this stuff. Uh, of courting, I also love. So you know, I, I've, we've talked about this before, right? Yes. So. We're all big screwball fans. We're all the peanut butter whiskey fans, right? I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but now I've got the bottle here thanks to James. I appreciate the gift. Uh, Old Smoky. So if you've ever heard of them, they usually do a lot of different varieties of moonshine, uh, different flavors and all that stuff of moonshine. Well, this is their version of peanut butter whiskey. It's about $11 cheaper per bottle for the same size bottle than Screwball. Why didn't you tell me this? I told you I was at the liquor store. (laughs) (laughs) $11 cheaper than Screwball. And I'm not going to say it's better, but for those that want a stronger peanut butter taste... 100%, 100%, and this has a stronger peanut butter. Taste. It also has, so for, for especially, I know like my wife, she, I let her try a little bit of it because we got some last week to try on the air and it was good. She tried it and she liked it because it didn't necessarily have that whiskey bite. That's what so, I'm saying. It's more of the butter, uh, the peanut the butter. Peanut butter yeah. So, and it's, it's, so it's good. If you want something introducing you to the peanut butter, that's definitely a good one to start. Try it. These guys got me going on it between Ryan and Fred. Try it with some ginger ale and amazing get to liquor stop tell them birdland bs sent you get your 10 percent off all right fred are you, are you are you gonna give me shit for this or are we just gonna <laughs> are we just gonna leave it up here? no i was just leaving it up there just to make sure that you saw all right, it well let me let me address this then you know it's like the royal we this is the royal wifey i was speaking in general to everyone's wifey out there not my wonderful wifey trying to get me to do the royal work. you Kelly. Yeah, the royal wifey i didn't use your name <laughs> hey, That's true. hey, Ryan, uh, if you go out that door right behind James, there's a there's a, a shed in there. I'm sure you can find a bigger shovel. <laughs> so take out that hole you're in. Everybody oh, else man. is wifey. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. All right, Ryan, it's time for some shell and tell. It's been a minute since we've talked about this, uh, since we've talked Terps, because honestly, I mean, there's been bigger things going on around the Baltimore sports media, and honestly, the Terps – basketball squad for a while there hadn't done a whole lot to be excited about but they are probably one of the more bipolar teams in the big 10 right now had some big wins but yet some very interesting losses well basketball's been the opposite of football re- recently you know we're always excited about football in the off season looking at all these big signings everything right well with basketball there were no big signings this year and that's kind of where we, we've <laughs> where we've been hurt um we lost all these big men over the last years. Bruno left early. Sticks left early. The Twins dipped on us midseason last year. Yeah. And we didn't really replace it. So if you don't have a big man, then you got to lean on everybody else. Well, that's kind of the problem. They do have a big guy. They've got a seven foot 24 guy in Joel Mariel who has done absolutely nothing. He's been a five Joel star who? Joel Mariel. Joel who? <laughs> Mariel. Yeah. Yeah, so he's a hundred. Get my point. Yes, yes. <laughs> he's one hundred and fifty pounds. I can move yeah, him off the block. Exactly, no problem. But this guy was a five star recruit coming in. I get it. He's still young. Not coming he's, in. He was a five star recruit as a freshman. Then his legs fell apart. He was only a three star. Right. Everybody keeps trying to hold him to that five star like label. Well, you guys <laughs> want to hang on to those star ratings. I told you before. I am not a star rating guy. <laughs> they were like, no, 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 not a five star. We died. He got hurt. <laughs> it's three. Don't ruin our five star ratings. Right. Well, the Terps sit at seven and six on the year right now, which is. Something you don't usually see with this Terps basketball squad this early in the year being this close to 500. They're 2-5 and five in conference play. Eh, that can be a little deceiving because this Big Ten conference is good, Real good all the way across the board, through and through. But we've seen a couple of really big wins, both on the road. You go into Wisconsin and you beat a top-10 team in Wisconsin. You turn around this past Sunday – and you beat a top 15 team in Illinois. What do you make of this? And this week with Illinois, one of the best big men in the country with Coffee Cockburn. I mean, we, 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 we both Coburn. talked. Cockburn. <laughs> 
I don't care. I, the I went, K is silent. I went to school, bro. C O C K B U R N is Cockburn. You can say silent. Coburn all you want, but your name is Cockburn. You're still an amazing basketball player. Just own that your name's Cockburn. I, I, nobody's gonna talk Cockburn and in inches. We got you're, all kinds of stuff. You're going three. On. You're three hundred pounds and seven foot tall. I'm not trying to talk trash to you, but your name's Cockburn. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we they got they got the win there. Obviously, Luca Garza also another one we've been dealing Bro, with. Luca Garza, that Iowa team as a whole is absolutely ridiculous. They, I mean, they were shooting the lights out of the gym. Garza looks like he should be a ten year vet in the NBA at this point. I mean, his, his his legs are the size of tree trunks. The guy looks like he's on a whole nother level of competition with anybody down low. Not just against the Terps. If you watch any of the games he's played, he's Physically dominated every opponent. I feel yeah, like I've if, heard that name for years now. If, if you have. Yeah, you and, have. In, and if this was the 90s, he would have been a top 10 draft pick two years ago. Right. But they just don't care about big men in the NBA anymore. They just don't. You have to be able to jump outside and defend a guard. That's not his deal. He's right. dominating the paint. Same with Coffee, uh, Coffee Cockburn. They're, they're, he would have been a top Coburn. 10 pick. <laughs> We're not doing that. <laughs> you guys already Cockburn did that shit once. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I know one of the guys that you've been high on since the Terps signed him or you know brought him in uh, since day one, Eric Ayala. You've been an Ayala tr uh, truther yep. since through and through. He wasn't active for this Illinois game uh, due to a groin ish is issue. <laughs> there we go. Inches, cockburns, groin, groin injury. issues. Uh, I, 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 <laughs> I wasn't even going there. <laughs> Golly. So, but you don't have Eric Ayala out there. You get some, you know, playing time for some of your younger guys. Marcus Dockery got some minutes in this game. You know, some of the younger freshman guards. Hakeem Hart, who has been a complete surprise this year, has been shooting very, very well, even with that weird shooting motion that he has. They beat a number 13 team without their leader in Eric Ayala. Well, that's one because, of their leaders. That's because he's not the leader. The leader is Daryl Morcell. Daryl Daryl Morcell. Face mask himself. Yes. If Daryl Morcell doesn't lose an orbital bone in one of these games where we have a lead, we probably have another win in the Big Ten. Um, and so he loses that one. He sits out. We go on a losing streak, comes back with his Rip Hamilton mask after he's got his scar done. I forgot Rip Hamilton. And, and, That's and, he's, and he's and he's unable to play with it. He said he said it was distracting. He couldn't get through. He was seeing shadows. And uh, Mama Morcell came through for us. Mama Morcell told him, you put that mask on and you wear it all day, every day, no matter what you're doing. Right. And that's what he decided to do after he you know put on a no show with it. And he dominated in this game. Well, the Terps got it to put it together. I mean, they shot 40% from the field, 40% from three in this game against the Illinois. Uh, I think, you know, when you when you win a game, 66-63, it's the little things that you do. Obviously, you, you're, you want to shoot the ball well, uh, but getting to the free throw line and being successful at the free throw line plays large, and it played large in this game as the Terps shot 82%. 14 for 17 from the free throw line, whereas Illinois was 8 to 12. 66 percent you, know, you talk about the little things and the team doing all the right things those six points that that three points that you won in that game it swung by, by shooting well at the free throw line free throw line's always huge with us that's how we lost uh i believe it was the iowa game they had a really low percentage from the free throw line right um after we jumped out to a lead in that game uh that's always been a, a complaint of people with Mark Turgeon is that his teams have too many turnovers and his teams don't shoot the free throw as well. So I feel like the players are the ones shooting free throws. I don't know how you put that on a coach, but it's always been things people say. Well, the Terps were set to take on Nebraska this Saturday. Unfortunately, that game was canceled right prior to the show uh, due to COVID. Uh, apparently, there was a COVID outbreak at the University of Nebraska, so they've canceled that game. They are looking for a, a replacement opponent, apparently. They're trying to reschedule this game. Who knows what's going to happen, but looking beyond that, they've got a matchup next week with number 7, Michigan. Yet another Big Ten team, another Big Ten team in the top 10 how do you see us matching up with them? Is this a game that we can win, or is this kind of a crapshoot? We just don't know what Terps team's going to show up. Yeah, I don't know how you predict this. What the Terps <clears throat> have an advantage of is, though they have no big men, all of their men are large for their position. <laughs> their guards are, are bigger than the average guard. Their forwards are, are handling it. If Dante Scott could play a four and not have to man up on somebody's center every week, he would be one of the best fours in the Big Ten. Right. But he keeps having to match up with somebody's five. Uh, we have length all around the court, which is why you get turnovers, you get steals, you get, you know, 
shutting down passing lanes, and you can make these things happen. And if you shoot well, you win. I don't. I there's no point in predicting. Morsell said they're built different. Right. He's right. They're built real different. No basketball teams ever looked like this, right. and we're just trying to figure out how to play with it. Scott, I, you haven't had a chance to chime in yet. I got to get your take. What's been your take on this Maryland team as a whole? This bipolar win lose thing, win big games, lose versus some you know this, inferior opponents. This comes back to one of the things that we've talked about over the past few years, and you and I have, have talked about this. I feel it nauseum. I think this resorts back to, to coaches Tur Coach Turge's coaching ability, right? He can he's good at, at recruiting and getting these guys in, but not necessarily helping them get over that hump. Some of these guys have have some struggles. Uh, one guy who played well in this game, but I don't know if you guys, I was, I'm really curious to get both of your takes on this. Did you guys see Turge's interview after the game in reference to Daryl Morcel and how like he immediately, he was asked about Morcel and he immediately went to like criticism mode on Morcel. So that, that brings up a good point, right? I wanted to get your take on this, right? This isn't just one thing. This isn't an isolated incident with Turge this year. Turge has been pretty vocal and called Critical. out some of his players in recent interviews that he's done. He did it with Chol. Uh, he's done it with Daryl Morsell. It, it, there's no bias here. He's calling out some of his senior leadership. Uh, this is something I, I've i personally never seen from Turgeon. What do you think he's trying to do? Is this like a psychological play? I, I guess it must be. I mean, he's been complaining mostly of toughness, that they're not tough. Yeah. Now, I don't know how he can say about Daryl Morsell. There might be a lot of other people on that team. I don't know how he can say about Dante Scott either. Right. <laughs> so those two check off the box tough. Uh, right. And I don't know the, what, one way or the other with the rest of the squad. Um, but he has just said they basically fold. Like we get in these long runs, and basketball is a game of runs. And when somebody runs up on them, all of a sudden it's just over. And they're not they're, – he says there's not the effort. And I've seen it a couple times. I can't see it as like instantaneous. But by the end of the game, I don't think they're given given full effort. Right. Uh, but I I like a little bit of what's happening with Turge. We've talked even before these critical, like early when they were when they were winning games in the non conference schedule, that there was this like angry old man that remind me of the Gary Williams. Like right. he was getting more hyped up on the sidelines. He was yelling at refs at that point. He was yelling sweating little, out of his jacket. Yeah, there's a little more <laughs> edge. I mean, when you've been told you're on the hot seat at a job for what four years? Right. Are you not going to be a little snippy? Are you not going to be a little angry? Hey, bro, you better pay better because I'm going to lose this $6 million a year job because you're not making a free throw. <laughs> maybe maybe Williams sat down with him and had a conversation because not only that, but you talk about some of the things you and I have talked about, the on-the-court differences with the press that was Gary Williams kind of, you know, what he hung his coat on. Like, that was his, 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 his key thing. We're starting to see that out of this squad too. Yeah, you, you don't know if it's just complete necessity because, again, you're – team doesn't have any big men you have to find a way to win and use the length that you do have in your guards but it could just be the fact that we're going to play a maryland band of brass uh, uh, brand of basketball like gary williams is in this tree right he's what director of basketball operations i think is the title right, right. um so he's got some say obviously he's it's turge's team turge does what he wants he recruits well but if you go to him and say this is what I, we need to do with this team technically your boss right i mean you would he, think he can't fire him he's got to go to somebody else for that but i'm sure he has hey we should fire this guy right power the only thing i would say with with the whole more cell situation is a the guy he was your highest scorer in the game first off 19 points in the game so he's your highest scorer but then as an as a as a school you then post this video afterwards this is the audio from the video Man, I'm 3 0 in this building. That went for EA, straight like that, man. We're going back home on a plane with good vibes. Yep. Shout out to Nation. Ah! That's that's been something that we've seen a lot of in the post game videos. Some you know, some of the videos that have kind of leaked out of the 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 coach speak in the locker room, some of the fun that the guys are having. They've got these like selfie stick videos that they're doing as they're walking off the court. This is something different that we've never seen from this Terp squad. It's a it, culture it kinda, change coming over from the football side. Maybe it is. Maybe it is. Maybe it's this new, you know, they're trying to be, we talked about it with the football squad, trying to be completely transparent with everything, trying to rebuild the image or the brand of the University of Maryland. And maybe that is what this is, leaking into the basketball team. Yeah, I mean, Darren Marcel is not wrong. If there's one team in the Big Ten we've had their number, it's the Illini. Right. You think about 3-0 and in, his, in that building, and what about the big shot Anthony Cowan hits from, what, 85 feet away yeah, right. last year? From Gary Williams' name. From Gary Williams' yeah. name. Right. I mean, that's 
they've had and they're not bad squads. They've been a really good team and they've they've had their number. Right. Um and there's Daryl Morcell's playing great. I've already started hearing rumors that he's coming back next year, which I really would love it if that's the option because we're again in this place where we don't get to benefit from this because we don't have these like abundance of seniors that matter that we could be getting a year out of. We got one guy right. like Reese Mona coming back next year. Sure, that's nice. He, he maybe he gets another you know some free free play out of it. And he's played better than expected when he's gotten on the court. But we have both talked about when he got the scholarship. Reese Mona getting that scholarship means Turge failed to sign that, that man you needed. A hundred percent. Absolutely. Well, you mentioned Anthony Cowan, right? Uh, there was some news recently. We, you know, obviously the NBA draft has come and gone. Anthony Cowan didn't get drafted in the NBA draft, but he did get drafted over the weekend. Yeah. Anthony Cowan drafted number 16 overall to the new G league. It's not the developmental D league anymore. Gatorade put up some cash actually paying these boys a little bit. Right. And they're calling the G league for the Memphis Grizzlies organization. Um, I think it's I think it's good. Like I do too. We saw that Melo Trimble got his shot in pro basketball, but he had to go all the way over to Australia to do so. I I think that it was really hard once he was making a good amount of money over there and playing well to just make that jump back into the NBA. When you're in the developmental league, it's one step and a jump, and you're in the NBA. Cowan's the kind of guy that could prove it against his talent. Right. You know, you, when you're seeing him week in week out against the guys that are almost good enough, maybe you'll start believing it because you just look at his height. And, and things like that, and you write them off. But there's been players over the years that it didn't matter how tall they were. Right. You know, you're the Muggsy Boses of the world. It doesn't matter. And Cowan's close to that. I don't know if he's got enough speed to make up for it, but we'll see. And he might get a shot. This is the, Basically, this is the third round. I mean, the NBA only drafts right. two rounds. That's exactly right. It's a good so point. even though it's the developmental league, he only missed by 16 players. Well, yeah. Yeah, 16 players. He could have been, he could have been with And them. we've seen some good players come out of that develop, developmental league into the NBA that made the jump. So Anthony Cowan, look, he, he's, a, he's a good leader. Uh, he's a clutch player. He's a good shooter. He's a great free throw guy. I mean, he he's a physical player, likes to get to the basket quick. I, you know, I don't know if his speed translates to the NBA as much as it did in the college game. Kind of the same thing with Melo Tremble. He just couldn't beat some of these guys to the edge and get to the hoop. Uh, so we'll see kind of how that works out, but I'm just happy for him, you know, happy to see that he's going to get an opportunity somewhere. And I think Memphis would be a good, a good shot for him. A good fit. If nothing else, this just helps him in his other ventures. We already saw him. He was putting out this, uh, uh, one uh, athletic line. He was doing coaching clinics, things like that. So it gives you a little bit more credibility and helps him in the long term with that. Anytime these big time athletes at Maryland succeed in anything with sports, it's good for you in the long run because it helps them get back into the program, give to the program, be around the program more often and be relevant. Let's go down a quick list of some changes, some recent hirings, and some recent releases with the football squad. Obviously, we're still hyped after what was a pretty damn good year, an unexpected good year for the Terps football squad. Uh, we got some really good pieces there. Now it's just making those pieces gel and making them work, and Mike Loxley and crew uh, was active in making some moves. Yeah, we lost our uh, – well, didn't lose. We got rid of our OC, Scotty Montgomery. Um, there was a little bit of rumors that – he didn't matter this year anyway, that he lost his play calling ability after the Northwestern debacle right. that fell apart and that Loxley was basically running that show after that. Um, and with his release, that seems like that was a uh, valid. Um, and also our O-line coach, Brian Regan was released. Um, they were replaced by Dan Enos and Brian Baswell. Now, Dan Enos, I know he's got some connections to Loxley in his past job with Alabama. Yeah. He's got connections all over the country, but yeah. he was with uh, Alabama um, in was it 2018? Um, he was the... Uh, he was with Tua. Yeah, he was with Tua. He was the quarterback coach and assistant head coach or whatever they call that fake title. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Associate head coach. There That's it what is. it is. Yeah. Um, he's been the associate head coach a lot of places. And if, if somebody like Saban is going to give you that title, you're well respected. Right. This guy has bounced around. Some people aren't a fan of him. Uh, he failed miserably at Miami. So that, that kind of stenched up his resume. But... They had one of the most prolific offenses together with Mike Loxley's offensive coordinator, him as a quarterback coach. Two has already given his endorsement, thinking, saying that Talia will be in, in better hands and develop well with this guy. If, if, if two is happy with it, what better can you do? This, right. like, if, that's firsthand information. It worked for him. Let his brother get it. I like it. Talk a little bit about this offensive line coach, Braswell. I know he was a guy that was with the program last year, 
but now he's getting paid. Yeah, he was in this volunteer grad assistant role, um, kind of like Will Likely was volunteering with the team last year with the uh, uh, cornerbacks and special teams and stuff. Um, but he's transitioned into a paid role. Um, they said he's just well liked by the guys, a better recruiter, um, has some ties to some big time targets. Hopefully that we're that we're working on this Malinsky kid, the center from Florida. We're yeah. still trying to get. Right. He says he's a three star, but he's an awfully talented three star. He probably can step in and start for us. Um, so hopefully this helps out on the recruiting side of things because even though we've been developing a few players, if you're not getting six, 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 eight bodies on that line, it doesn't matter what you can develop. Well, this is what you need. When you start to see some players exit, which we did have some guys enter the transfer portal, most of these guys were tied to the previous regime uh, and, and, and Durkin's regime. Uh, this is what you gotta, you got to see. you got to see the new faces come in. Yeah, obviously, there's a the familiarity, like you said, with the offensive coordinator and, and uh, Talia already kind of working together when Tua's there. Uh, I think this is good moves for Maryland. I think this will allow uh, Mike Loxley to have somebody in the fold that he's comfortable with. I think that also – you can't go over to stated both coaches have NFL experience, which right. is huge with these guys. Um, and Braswell also had the AFL and XFL experience, um, which is becoming a big thing. I, I think the XFL is big. Uh, we did have some XFL related uh, news this week as well. XFL uh, or uh, yeah, we well uh, the player that uh, for the Browns. Where, where, where we oh go? yeah yeah yeah, he was playing Dunn. in the NFL league, or the XFL league. That's I can't think his break. name. What's his name? Uh, um, Michael Dunn. Yes, Michael Dunn, right. Yeah, it was a feel-good wow. story, man. He is playing for a little bit with the XFL, had bounced around with some practice squads in the NFL, ended up landing with the Browns and had been on the practice squad for a little bit with the Browns. Well, due to some injuries and the unforeseen you know, circumstances, he was starting. Yeah, I mean, this is a guy just perseverance. Yeah. You, you didn't get drafted. You got cut from multiple teams. You played in the XFL. The XFL folds. Right. You get back in the training camp and get cut again, and now you're playing in the playoffs, starting. In pretty the awesome. playoffs. So, you know, never give up, kids. That's right. <laughs> All right, Scott, it's time for this week's rundown. <clears throat> and let's start this rundown off with <laughs> – a topic that I want us all to kind of chime in on this. I want us all to talk a little bit about this, but where are you going first with this? <laughs> when is enough with the juju and the <laughs> dancing and the TikTok and bullshit? Like, I get it. Like, this is a younger generation. And I'm an old guy at this point, right? And, and I, I, I enjoy TikTok. I go down those TikTok rabbit holes where I'm on there for like an hour and I felt like I was on there for five minutes. I get it. But, I mean, you're being paid as a professional athlete, right, to, to get out there and perform. And in a game against these against these Browns where you're trailing by 20-some points, he's still out on the fucking field dancing and doing his jig. How is Mike Tomlin dealing with this, and how is he putting up with it? I don't know. Like, I don't know what's going on. I, I question. There, there's a part of me that questions how much longer Tomlin is is going to have a job in Pittsburgh. And here's the reason what? I say it. This is the worst take than the Deshaun Watson shit. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Scott. Finish your point. Let me anyway, <laughs> this is the biggest debacle in Pittsburgh history. They went from being 11-0 and and, and dominating what appeared to be dominating league. We all agree. Dominating record-wise. We all agree it was the worst 11-0 team we've uh, seen. 100%. 100%. But you in Pittsburgh's eyes, look at the fans, right? Look at the fan base. They're not happy about this whole situation. Yeah. They're not happy about that. You go in, you go in against the team that you, sh every, everybody, including myself, was expecting you to shut down the Browns. You can't do that. The horrible snap, the inability to control Juju Smith Schuster. This is now two players that Mike Tomlin has not been able to control off the field in Brown. And now Schuster. Don't forget, Bell. mind you, you got Chase Claypool also on chiming TikTok. in, chiming in, saying, "Oh yeah, they ain't going to do shit against the Chiefs. They're going to get clapped back against the Chiefs. Doesn't matter anyway." Right. So <laughs> it's it's that's why I make that statement. So you can say it's as bad as my take last week. I don't care. I'll stand I, listen. That was a Ryan thing. I didn't say it was a bad take, Scott. Yet. You laughed. Focus here. You laughed. Me and you. <laughs> it was funny. It was funny. Because the Watson <laughs> take was terrible. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Uh, it's, I, I, I do question the, his ability to control the team. Is he losing the team? Is he losing what's happening in his control? I mean, he's been there for, what, 11, 12 years now, if, if not 13? 
Yeah, and, and Tomlin has always been a guy who's had all the players respect, but he's also been a, a no tolerance kind of guy. Like, he which is what surprises me I, about all this. And I, that's why I'm saying I agree with your point. I, I I wonder what's going on there that Tomlin hasn't put his foot down, or does he feel like you know the entertainment value doesn't affect the game, and you know this is just this younger generation doing young things like. To us, it's annoying to us because we hate the Steelers. But, you know, I wonder what the Steeler fan base feels about this. You know, like, are they entertained by Juju? If this was, you know, Hollywood Brown or if this was, you know, Lamar doing these antics, how would we feel about it? Like, would we be okay with it? I don't know. I don't know. How, don't are, know. how are Steelers fans feeling, Fred? How are they really feeling right now? I don't know. You tell me. I fucking had it, bro. <laughs> <laughs> fucking bullshit, bro. <laughs> I fucking had it. I fucking had it. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> Fuck you, Pittsburgh. Seriously, dude. <laughs> Fuck this shit, bro. You know that fucking Baker Mayfield do this shit to you, bro. <laughs> What the fuck? <laughs> Go 11 and 0! 11 and 0 when you fucking do this shit! Are you fucking kidding me? You fucking fuck this shit! Fuck this shit! Oh, fuck. Man. <laughs> I fucking love it, but there is so much to digest in that video, including an ass crack that goes on for days that becomes a back crack. It's not even an ass crack anymore. It's a back crack. You got hockey on the TV, but he's bitching about a football game. I don't know what the fuck's going on in this game, in this video. But Steeler fans are very emotional, especially this guy. It was like the end of the game cut to, to you know, Sports Center, and they're talking about hockey, not the game just happened. And he gets pissed off. Oh, man. Like, oh, my God. I get it. Like, this was probably set up. I mean, how convenient that there's a ladder sitting there. You got hockey on the TVs, crying about the game, like, as if it just How happened. about the Pittsburgh Steelers shirt that looks like it was hand-drawn? Yeah, and had to cut in it like a Hulk Hogan shirt did back in the day. <laughs> the guy had man titties all over. Ugh. A lot to digest going on. Ryan, I know you had a lot of opinions before the show on this. How did you feel about this video? Yeah, I mean, it's 100% set up. My man's got a ladder out like he's doing work to his house, but he's got 1970s lighting. That curtain hasn't been changed since the 1970s. Those Christmas lights were up since 1947. Like, uh, no, no, you weren't doing any work. Steel workers don't make a whole lot of money there, Ryan. Right? Anybody, anybody, like, anybody else feel like that looked like a, uh, a the layout of a, of a Dundalk? Townhome, row home. That's that's Pittsburgh. That's the whole I know, city. but that's my point. Like, that's what it looks like. I think that was oh, Mike Pouncey's brother. <laughs> <laughs> Very well could have been. Very well could have been. Uh, well, you mentioned Mike Tomlin potentially uh, losing his job. Is his are his I'm days not, no, I'm numbered? Saying, I'm, I, I wonder. I wonder if his days are numbered with the with the debacle, the inability to control two two major players now that they've lost due to that reason. I don't know. It's all. I think there's there's warrant there. Okay, Ryan's got something else you're, to say. You're saying fired, right? Fired, not retiring. Because big when's ben his and contract? Are when's his contract walking. up? His contract's up in the next year. It's got to be up in the next year or two. It's just you they just don't re-sign him. It's gonna be a rebuilding time for the Steelers. Look at their entire. I mean, they have a bunch of guys that they need to re-sign. I don't know that you say. In two years, Tomlin is still the guy coaching this team. I just think if he's fired, twenty-five teams would line up to put him in, put him in their head coaching oh, they, role. Right, and so maybe if he retires to go to the booth because Big Ben's leaving, because Pouncey's leaving, he doesn't want to be a part of this. He has nothing to earn. He's already got multiple Super Bowls. He's already one of the best court, your you know coaches there is. But I don't know. You can't fire. Even if you wanted to fire this guy, you have to go to him and be like. Hey, bro, I need you to resign and go out with Ben. Like, you don't fire him. Go ahead, James. I think they only had, what, four coaches their whole career? That, yeah, they're, in their entire existence, they had three. Three. Three head coaches. They ain't going nowhere. A exactly. That's kind of how I feel about it. But, I mean, this is a new day and age in the NFL, right? We got head coaches on short leashes, <laughs> including one up in Philly, Doug Peterson. You're who fired. He is fired. <laughs> Relieved of his head coaching duties after, what, five years with the Eagles? After, what, winning a Super Bowl just a couple of years ago? 
Uh, I get it. Like Carson Wentz hasn't worked out. Things have been kind of a mess up there. You had the debacle at the end of the season against the Redskins, against the Washington football <laughs> team, where you pull your your starter in Jalen yeah. Hurts, your, your potential future quarterback in Jalen Hurts out, uh, and you lose that game. So there, there was a lot of things, but do you think this was too harsh? Do you think this was like a reactionary to that, or do you think this is justified? I think there's disagreement on the future of the Eagles franchise. I think he thinks one thing and management and and the ownership thinks another. Okay. I think they truly think J Jalen Hurts is the way to go. I think he's or or vice versa. He thinks Jalen Hurts is the way to go. He was looking to see what else he had, you know, on the bench in that game to see what he can what he's going to have to work with in the future. They already assumed that they were out of this thing. They weren't going to be playing. So, all right, let me adjust. But at the same time, you know, if if they if the management, if management and ownership are saying, "We just paid Carson Wentz." not long ago you need to use the guy that we're paying that we're paying for we're not paying for you know 20 million dollars a year to be sitting on the fucking bench we're not so doing you're it. you're of the mindset that they got rid of him because they're not using the quarterback that they're paying for so you think Carson Wentz will be the quarterback of the future for this team because another head coach will have to I deal think with him. I I think the ownership is saying we paid for him you need to use him cuz it's I mean it's Philly's done some of the weirdest shit in the past, right? It, they have. So I, I, there's something that tells me it's that they want to say, we're paying this guy, you need to use him, and, and no matter how well he's producing, how, we, how well he's not producing, you need to coach better, right? I feel like that's a Philadelphia mentality. Coach better. Okay. That's the short leash type mentality in the NFL. When it, 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 I heard something today on the way actually picking up from picking up our new toy. I, I heard inches, copper, <laughs> toys. <laughs> Where are we going? Why <laughs> into tires and bears? Oh my. <laughs> uh, but no, so they were, and they were talking about the fact that, you know, when it comes to this situation, there's, there's a lot that's happened, but these short leashes, why is it always the coaching, right? If the coaches had, had been there for five, six, eight years, you know, four or five years even, and didn't have a winning season under their belt and were really struggling and couldn't, literally couldn't rebuild. Right. Then that's one thing. But this is a guy who won a championship for you. Yeah. Just two, what, two with years big ago? Nick, Nick. <laughs> and, and I think he wanted to go with Nick and they said, no, Carson. I think he, I really truly think he wanted to stick with Nick. Look at the situations that they had. I know he didn't have a choice, but he. I think he liked Nick better than he did Carson. He saw the upside after Carson's injury. He saw that it was. He saw that it was there. I think he thinks Jalen was the future. But he says, you know what? You guys are want it. Here's what you got. You know what Carson's done all year. Here's what you got sitting on the bench. Go figure it out next year. Interesting I think he take. Knew. I like it, Drew. What do you got? I'm gonna go ahead and disagree with you. <laughs> that was the most elegant. Disagreement. Well, so soft. I don't want to quite yell with the whole Tomlin things. I kind of agree with you on Tomlin. <laughs> oh man, after hours would be great. <laughs> Stick around for the after hours. Anyway, yeah. I'll be home late, Kaylee. Anyway, <laughs> how my how in the hell does Howie Ro Ro Roseman Rossman whatever doesn't matter? He ran out Reed and he's run out Peterson. How does a GM like that stick around when? Okay, you're the one that architects this team. I disagree with you on the fact that you're saying Peterson wanted nothing to do with her. I think he's with the Jets now. Did they want to maybe take Wentz to the Jets? I think he's out. I think he with the Jets now. Is he out? I, didn't hear, I didn't hear. I didn't hear he was oh, out. No, but. no, Rossman's still there. Yeah, he's still yeah. there, as far as I know. So my point being was this: he drafted Hurts. He wants Hurts, and Peterson don't want nothing to do with Hurts. Look back at that game. He also drafted Wentz. Okay, but you, you you went with this whole new special type of player that you're seeing around the league. If not only did he go with Wentz, but he paid Wentz. Yeah, well, and he, pay, he too, paid though. Wentz, and then you still go draft Hertz. You didn't think Hertz? I think Hertz was a situation for them. He fell into their lap. He they didn't think he was going to be there when he was, and it was the best player on the board that they thought that but, was on their board. So they took him. Well, see that, that, and that goes back to my point of how the hell does the GM make these decisions for years and it, outlast two coaches it's, when it's he's e making a decision on a quarterback you don't need them it's easy across the nfl because all the gms have to do is say 
they're not playing the guy. This coach isn't playing the guy that the guys that I am putting out there for him to play. Alex brings up a good point, though. He says he's hired five coaches. Normally, they go, they're going after one or two coaches. He's still there. He needs to go. I get it. Fair enough. James, what do you think? So I'm going to give you the take because before I was a Ravens fan, I was a Philadelphia fan because we didn't have a team. and that was my, I, I picked them over Washington because I hate the colors and I like Randall <laughs> Cunningham and what he did. So I was an Eagle fan. And he's just not so, racist, so he picked the Eagles. So, <laughs> so apparently ownership didn't know what a Pierce's direction was going to go with the team if he could get them back to with what they had to the caliber they want. But apparently the owner is big in love with Wentz. He loves Wentz. And I think the owner wants Wentz as his franchise quarterback. They're paying him. I don't know why they drafted uh, Hurts unless they did because he fell into the, the direction. But when you pay this guy all that money, it wasn't like, you know, five years into the contract. He was He's still into that contract. So the ownership loves Wentz. And yeah. Pierce said, I don't think he was for Wentz, and he wanted to go with Hurts. So, I mean, that was Pierce. How do you fire a coach? No owner wants dead money, and that's right. what Wentz is yeah. right now. And, and no one's going to take Wentz's contract. I'm sorry. Nobody. <laughs> but so, you could flip Hurts for a couple of nice picks right now. So I You don't think high. a team – and think, this, is, this is kind of my question to you guys because Wentz is an interesting, an interesting topic because when he was healthy and before the knee – he was dominant. He was a great quarterback. Yeah. I mean, he was playing at an MVP level right yeah. before the injury. But, but the thing is, both teams of in Pittsburgh, I mean, in Philadelphia, I mean, in Pennsylvania, it's a shit show. Like they both are screwed in both directions. Like players are going to need to be signed for Pittsburgh. You got a lot of people retiring. The offense line sucks, and you got the whole defense that you got to sign. And then Philadelphia, you overpay these guys that are not doing anything. Like like uh, the one that's coming off now is Jeffries. He's not coming back. Then you got running backs that you don't yeah. know what you're going to do except Sanders looks good, and they have no wide receivers. Their tight end might be traded or not signed um, Ertz. Right. So yeah. it's, it's gonna, a shit show. They're going to be like $74 million in the hole. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. And Pittsburgh's already over the cap, apparently, depending on if the cap's going to be higher or lower. I got gotcha. you. Ryan, what do you think about this whole thing? I mean, I don't, I don't know how the – Coach can be fired without the GM. You're right. This is a lot of coaches he's rolled through. Uh, I think that the GM, if he has something going on and if he's going to make good on what this draft pick was and turn, what was he, uh, their second round pick, I think, yeah. last year? Yeah. Yep. So if he can turn that two into two ones, which is pretty close to where I see his value sitting right now, then the GM will be able to keep his job a lot longer. But That'd be the only thing if the coach was mad about losing that his his cash baby. I know that I, I get like the whole conversation to, to James's point about like the contract with Wentz and nobody's going to want it and all. But you get a team like let's say the Indianapolis Colts, right? They're obviously going to have a mid twenties, later twenties pick in the draft, right? So they're not going to get one of those top echelon quarterbacks, right? You know, they're going to go in the top ten picks, right? But they're built to win right now. Phillip Rivers is more than likely going to retire. Now he's coming back. I think he's going to retire. And if he doesn't, if he does come back, it's for one year. So they got to get a quarterback in there. In Washington. Jacoby Brissett isn't the option. Jacoby Brissett isn't the the future, right? So what what do you think about the Indianapolis Colts trading for a the potential of Wentz getting a change of scenery, having a great defense around him, having a great offensive line in front of him, which is what he needs, having two legit running backs behind him. I, I see what you're saying. The, the, the piece I think that James is 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 100% right on here is after the injury, he's had the chance to show recovery and he can't, right? That's why he's been pulled. Does it change of scenery work for him? Maybe. But the problem is, is you have to, it, it, Pittsburgh, or not Pittsburgh, uh, Philadelphia is going to have to eat a portion of that contract if you're going to trade him. It's, and it's going to have to be a Half. decent portion. It's going to have to be a decent portion. It's going to have to be a quarter, at least a quarter at the absolute minimum, if not half, half. to get him to get out of, of, of Philly but, in order if you want to well, go with Hurts. So that has to happen in order to do it. I just don't know. I don't know that the Colts are willing to do that because that's a, that's a risk for the Colts because you don't know truly, is he truly healthy, Yeah. right? That's the biggest question. 
This is supposed to be the rundown. This is supposed to be quick. This is yeah, a good no. debate. We're going to bring this up in the after hours. So if you want to hear us talk more about this, because we've got a lot of personalities in here with a lot of opinions on this. No so we're talk don't more pay about quarterbacks. This. We're going to talk more about this in the rundown. You got the position wrong. Don't pay running backs. So, <laughs> Scott, all right. A lot, of, a lot of big news out of MLB. Not Orioles oh. related, but a couple of big stories. No. So I'll start with the two that actually aren't on here. Just a quick hit them. One, Ryan alluded to at the beginning of, beginning of the show. Uh, they announced it that, you know, Rob Manfred says, hey, prepare for a, for a full spring training and a full 162-game season. Yay! And the news that came out today, the the MLB will not mandate any proof of vaccines or negative tests in order to attend a game. Yay! However, it will be up to the state, local authorities, and teams if they want to make any regulations beyond that. Hogan, not letting you in a game, <sighs> bro. No, not happening. No opening not happening. day, Fred. Not no happening. No opening day. No. Although, opening day is good in Alabama, apparently. <laughs> Did you watch that celebration? <laughs> well. They look like New yeah. Year's Eve, like, you know, prior to 2020. Yeah, no. Well, it's Alabama. Yeah. Bunch of inbreds. But you'd think they've been there before, like 18 other times. I think six I think, out of the last 12 years. What is it? Does anybody know what? Okay, any, this is another one that anybody, we're going to get out of rabbit hole with. Does, does anybody know what Alabama's COVID rate is? Because the inbred, maybe they're onto something. Maybe no, it's very maybe, high. Maybe it's low. Yeah. It looked like it was their first championship game. Yeah, yeah, that's right? what I'm saying. You would think they've been there before. All right. Yeah. So the so, big stories. The big stories, though. Uh, the first one came later this week. Major trade news. The biggest trade of the offseason. Shortstop Francisco Lindor traded by the Indians along with Carlos Carrasco. Oh, yeah? To the Mets. Wait, he's not an Oriole? Wait a minute. Wait, <laughs> there was this whole trade out there with Adley Rutschman and the entire farm to come to the Orioles, no? No, no, it didn't uh, happen. It just it couldn't work out. Thank God. Um, thank God. Uh, and so the Mets, the Mets get those two guys, and the Indians get infielder Andreas Jimenez, infielder Ahmed Rosario, right handed pitcher Josh Wolf. And outfielder Isaiah Green. If you don't know those guys, neither do we. Okay. 162 games. It takes up three quarters of a year. Why do we got to talk about it in the offseason? <laughs> anyway. This is a guy. He's he's one of the top uh, five players, I would think, in, oh, in, no, in Major League Baseball. No right doubt. Now. And honestly, to me, he's he is a top three player in MLB right now with his with his he, he's got he's he's a five tool player. He he's gonna get of one of those three, four hundred million dollar contracts. He's gonna, he's not gonna he's not gonna get Harper money. No, I think he'll get Manny money. It, he'll get Manny money. And I do. he will get Manny and, money and he'll and they're gonna regret it because he's starting to have a lot of injury issues. He is, I think, but that's the thing is the Mets need a face right now. And I, I, I think they, they had, uh, uh, what's his face? He's, the guy, the, this the rookie. Is, this, Who was the rookie? Oh, shit. Oh, he won the home uh, run derby. First base, the first base. First base. Yeah, I can't remember his name. Pete, Pete Alonzo. Pete Alonzo, yes. So, I mean, he's, he's a guy I think you could have made a face, but it just doesn't work. This, to me, is another, this is Robinson Cano 2.0. You know, for the for, for the that's Mets. a little bit of a stretch. I just think that this they got is a, Robinson Cano later and much later in his career than I, they're getting Lindor. I just think it's a big signing that's not going to amount to much. Like if you don't put anything else around him, I mean, yes, I understand they've got this great first baseman, but you know, I just I don't see it being a difference maker enough to make these guys World Series contenders, especially when you've got pitching talent the way that they do that's going to require a ton of money here soon. Yeah, Are they going to be able to pay them too? I know it's I know it's, it's New York. There's no salary There's cap. There's no salary cap. <laughs> but when's the last time you saw the Mets do anything like this except for that, you know, ridiculous Bobby Bonilla deal that they are still paying on they, I mean, 45 they did, years they later. They technically did something similar back in the Piazza days, right? They 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 gave Piazza a big contract that Wound up working out for a little while while he was there. I guess it's so true. It, it's it's there. I think there. I think there's something to be said for it. Either way, dude's going to get paid, right. and he's already said he's open to, to contract talks. So keep it in New York. Another story. Yeah. So uh, this one actually goes goes uh, across the nation here. The other story is Yankees Garrett Cole, Astros Justin Verlander, and Nats Max Scherzer. So literally three of the top ten pitchers in MLB right now. Yeah, period. Hundred percent are all. Accused of doctoring baseballs in a pending lawsuit with former Angels clubhouse attendant Bubba Harkins and the MLB. So here's the deal. Harkins filed this back in 2019, at the end of 2019 when he was released. All right. The deal is, is Harkins has been 
accused of helping pitchers to doctor the ball, find substances, etc. So in a counterclaim that he is fi- that he has filed, and this is due to due to the courts, you can get access to all this stuff. He's saying it's this whole thing has made him unemployable. Uh, and he says that no other individual has been punished this in this way for for you know creating doctored baseballs. But he's produced a text message from Garrett Cole from 2019. Okay. How incriminating is this if this is 100% true? And here's here's the apparent text message according to the documents. Hey, Bubba, it's Garrett Cole. I was wondering if you <laughs> Here's could- my social security number, 21984. <laughs> <Right. laughs> I was wondering if you could help me out with this sticky situation, winky face emoji. We don't see you until May, but we have some road games in April that are in cold weather places. The stuff I had last year- seizes up when it gets cold so that's what i was going to ask you this doctoring the baseball thing this is a another like pine tar situation this is a substance that they have on them that they're using it's out a, there on the it's, mound it's a phil necrophile in the pocket type situation wow. right these guys are, are are finding ways whether it's sweat putting something on you your shampoo you put snot <laughs> on the ball <laughs> So it, it's it's one of those things that it's just Crisco, Bardol, I actually Vagisil. right <laughs> <laughs> as he reaches into his, reach into his I ain't got a fastball like yours. I got to put anything on I can find. <laughs> right, someday you will too. Two, exactly. So, but here's the deal. I mean, this is the top three pitchers in baseball being accused of this. This I think we have said this before, and I'm interested that there there is one person in the room that I know because I know we've we've heard James take before, but we actually haven't heard Drew's take on this. Yeah, we all are in agreement. Just let a pitch. I don't care. Rub up the balls, whatever, whatever, whatever the hell you want. Rub up the balls. Rub up the ball. <laughs> rub up the balls with those. Get those inches. All right, let's go. <laughs> right, let's go right to Drew's mouth after we rubbed up the balls. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> So, uh, Drew, what a what, shit show. What is your take on doctoring baseballs and Major League Baseball and their whole take on this? My worry is not, I don't know if worry is the word. My thing is, everyone that's not a real baseball fan is going to look at this and look at and compare it to the Astros and the with the video shit. It's not the same thing. It's something that, yes, you, it's. You could frown upon it, but it is something that has happened in the game for fucking more than a hundred years. Right? There's Hall of Famers that built that have built their careers off of doing this, and it's not seen as a big deal. A lot of what happens, especially nowadays, and you've seen it in a couple of years ago with uh, fuck, I'm forget, I'm, I'm forgetting the guy's name, but there's been situations where oh, the Yankees pitcher, yes, the, um, the guy that came from Seattle. Uh, shit, what was his name? Then, I know other, you're talking about. There's other situations, though. It's not the fact that when you do it, it's one thing. But when people know you're doing it, when you're a known guy that does it. Pineda you, or you, whatever. Pineda, yeah, Michael Pineda. You've Pineda. done it too. Right. You've, you know, this is the third time we've played it, and it's been on that same hand. Like, that's when when you keep it going. Those are the ones where it's an well, issue. Brian Mattis. Me, yeah, I was going to say, Brian Mattis was in the same, was in the same series. It yeah. was Bar- Brian Maddox that was also accused of it and so, shown. To, to me, it's like that's my that's my is that's my worry is it's going to get lumped in with the the whole video thing. It's it's they're two completely different natures and it's not really it really. Here's the thing, a lot of people don't also realize a lot of that slick or anything they want to use that gives them grip can also prevent a guy from getting beamed in a goddamn head. Yeah, so that's I'm glad you brought that up because that that is the one thing that that I think is a benefit to them doing it. And Adit actually was going to the going to the well of what you were talking about. He says doctoring baseballs like sign stealing has been a part of MLB for the last 100 years. People are now realizing it, and it's because of the video content and things like that that people are realizing it. But to your point, the more control you have, the less issues we wind up having. I mean. We've talked about it before. You and I have talked about yeah. how many times over the past five to ten years have we seen guys get beamed in the head? It seems uh, it seems uncountable at this point. And it all started for us as Orioles fans with the Mike Mussina situation where he threw it a guy up in his head, and then the guy hits a bean ball back at him, and he gets it in the he gets it in the eye. Now it wasn't intentional. I get that situation, but 
the whole point is is the guys shooting it back up the middle. These guys can't have that have that ability with the bat. To that but, to that point, right? And this is kind of one of my arguments with this whole thing. Back in the day, there used to be one, two, maybe three guys in Major League Baseball that could hit 100 mile an hour, right? Now most teams have three, four guys in their bullpen that can hit 100 miles an hour. Oh, easy, right? yeah. These athletes are bigger, stronger, throwing the ball harder. That's just what this game is, meaning that they've got next to nothing as far as reaction time to be able to hit these balls, right? Or you got finesse artists like Michael Givens or, or Darren O'Day right. that can finesse the ball. So it, it, with all these people, these statisticians out there and analytics and all that stuff, there has to be studies that have done or could be done about how much more accurate pitchers would be if they're given the ability to doctor the balls. So if you're going to do it and you're going to turn a blind eye to it, then you allow pitchers across the board to do whatever they want. It's either that if, hold on, if it does help with the percentages and it keeps the accuracy better that way, or you completely do away with it, you find these guys heavily and you move the mound back another you know six inches, another foot, whatever it might be, to give the, the batters a little bit more time to react. Because to your point, it's becoming a safety issue. Yeah, I think, so here's the one thing that everybody forgets. What's on the mound of every major league ballpark? Yeah, it, it's a uh, rosin. It's a rosin bag. What's a rosin bag supposed to do? It's supposed to dry your hands up. And give you a better grip on the ball. Because your hands aren't sweaty. There's no moisture. Yeah. Right. It's something that's there. Give them. I don't care. Level the playing field. Put put a, a thing of a, a, vast, a, pine, a pine tar rag. Put, put something, something out there that allows it. You can't put it directly on the ball. But, but you, you can, can touch it. You can you can touch it with two fingers. Whatever you want to do. You can. It has to Two, stay on the three, ground. However many you use. I don't. I mean, I don't know how. I honestly don't know what the answer is. But a rising bag. That was the intent of a rising bag when a rising bag came out. That was the intent. It's time that baseball evolve and recognize these guys are doing this because they can't get a grip of the rising bag. I don't. I personally can't tell you the last time I saw somebody grab a rising bag. So according to Adit, uh, uh, Dylan Bundy was named in the report as well. I have to check that. Check into that. That, but, that may be very true. But, also, if you know Max Scherzer, he's got one of the dirtiest hats that he ever that anybody <laughs> has. Yeah. Like you don't know what's on there. His hat, like from beginning of uh, opening day to like the end of this season, looks like it's brown all <laughs> over the, the top. Sweat marks and, and he keeps the same Max, hat. Max Scherzer's got two different colored eyes. Maybe one of his eyes is actually pine tar. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't know. <laughs> Either way, I say I, I say at this point, just level the effing playing field. Put either do something mud some rub some different mud on the ball. I don't know what it is. I know they got away from the Delaware mud to an extent. So go back to that Mississippi I don't know, mud. I don't know what you need to do, but you need to level the playing field. Just do it. Put something on the mound. That's what the rising bags for. It's not working anymore. Fix it. Change it. boundaries two topics 30 seconds each it's time for the two minute warning gang signs all right scott it's time for the two minute warning so i'm gonna we're gonna switch it up so we've been giving drew shit all day okay drew gets to pick who goes first in the two minute warning all right. <laughs> he likes that. All, there's only two options, Drew. Which one? Me, me, me. I was going to go with, since he's back, Fred. All right. All right. I like it. I have no idea what's coming, so take it away, Drew. Not two inches. Or, well, Ryan, or Ryan. Ryan. Ryan's, Ryan's got, got a question. question. Be yeah. taking it away. Okay. I'm clueless. <laughs> all right. All right. Don't worry, it's not o two inches. OT Jared Beldner started for the Colts Saturday and has now signed with the Packers after they were eliminated from the playoffs due to a practice squad loophole. Uh, how do you feel about this, and do you think it should be allowed? Let's go. I mean, these guys are on the practice squad, right? So, like, how much of an impact are they going to have? This is the way that the rules are written. Uh, I don't have a problem with this. I think it's kind of a cool story. A guy goes from one playoff team, gets eliminated, thinks his dreams are over, gets called by another team, and he's right back in the playoffs, suiting up for two different teams. I think it's kind of cool. I don't have a problem with it. Uh, again, you're not hiding superstars on a practice squad, so I don't know how impactful these guys are going to be. It's a depth move. 
Yeah, so for me, I actually, it's funny because I, I led you guys thinking what I was going to go one way on the show and I wound up actually fucking agreeing with you. Which oh, there you go. I thought you were going to go the other way. So for me, I, I agree with you. Now, I do think uh, from what I w was reading, there is also apparently a loophole on the on the actual legitimate active squad. There is a loophole that these guys, if they are released, if they are defined released, they could join it. I think that loophole needs to be fixed. The practice squad I don't care about, it's the active roster I think needs to be fixed. Got it. With the success of Taylor Heineke and Michael Dunn, as we discussed earlier, from the XFL, do you think the league will finally put the financial support behind the developmental league instead of leaning on the NCAA? No. I don't think the NFL will do anything to support the XFL. It's sad because I really enjoyed watching the XFL this year. I thought it was a much better product. To your point, I think there's some good players coming out of it. I think the, Red, or the Washington football team – are in a situation where they might have found their quarterback of the future from a guy from the XFL who was their fourth string quarterback just a couple days ago. You know, I seem to recall myself saying that there might be some guys sitting out there that could be you did could be helpful. You did from the XFL, and, and here I gave we you find, no credit for that. You gave me no credit, and here we go now. Two guys come out. In fairness, you were talking about offensive linemen. Just we just discussed it, one of them. <laughs> Hello, what are we, we talking about, Fred? Uh, no, but look, look. Here's the deal. I think they need to get behind it. Will they? They absolutely won't. But you know what? Stupid <laughs> on them to do that because they absolutely should. They need to take a play out of every other league's book and have a developmental league. You impact. It's more money in the long run. It helps everybody. Well, hopefully Dwayne the Rock Johnson takes care of it for him then. <laughs> I hope so. Wait, maybe that's the end. Maybe he maybe he's the guy that can make it happen. Uh, all right, Scott. Well, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to everybody out there. Uh, I did see all your well wishes and your condolences and your thoughts and prayers. Uh, that means a lot to me. Uh, I didn't get a chance to say that before the show started. So thank you all. Uh, I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, yeah, I'll take I'll take us out. Yeah, buddy, we appreciate you coming back. Nice to have you back. Nice yeah, to have everybody. It was a good show, man. It's a lot of fun. Nice to have everybody back in the studio. I know we planned on that this week, last week. It happens this week, uh, minus Brian. But we appreciate you guys tuning in each and every week. Uh, I know that there is one thing that came up that we talked about, but we didn't address. We're going to address it in the after hours. We got a message on it on Twitter that we didn't directly address this person. So we've got to address Craig Zero directly oh, right. uh, in the after hours. Craig, I hope you're still watching. We didn't get the chance to get into it, but make sure you pay attention each and every week. Send us those comments. Send us those those likes, those follow subscribes. Give us everything at Birdland BS is how you find us. Check out our website, www.birdlandbs.com. I'm apparently the only one that always supports this place. Other than the Shell and Tell <laughs> guest over there, go to yourself who's wearing the Shell and Tell shirt. He's the only other wearing one wearing He's got some this type of 1980s video game vibe, guys. <laughs> go get it. it <laughs> works. Dun, 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 dun. Exactly. It works. Make sure you guys also follow the oh, <laughs> the audio oh, version God. of the podcast on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, wherever you listen to your podcast. Go check it out. Make sure you always tune in each week as you have been. For Fred, Ryan, James, Drew, Brian, who's not here, and myself, we'll see you guys next week. See ya! It's time for the after party. You know what? Maybe it will come in the FFL, XFL. Last call for alcohol. This asshole over what? here. This what is happening right now? Just, He's starting shit. Oh, was, two minute even warning. Not before the two minute warning. You started in the middle of the show, by the way, with the fucking Watson comments. I said, we'll, we'll, we'll find later. a Sean Watson's replacement in the XFL, and Scott lost it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's get to the comments. Watson's that we didn't get next to job the is with Watson. Shut the if fuck Watson, up. All of you guys. Anyway, up, anyway, anyway, anyway. Team nobody wants to care about this. After watching. Craig Zero says, after watching the highlights a lot, yesterday and today he was talking about the Ravens game. Lamar has grown a lot from the playoffs last year. Better decisions, better throws, better runs. They look in sync. 
all of the team. What are your thoughts on this game overall? And we kind of we got into that, right? We didn't address you, Craig, and I apologize that we didn't address you. It, there's a lot going on during this show. We have the peanut gallery over there. They're called that for a reason. We have because we they, have we have a lot of dick and inches jokes going on. <laughs> there, there was a whole lot of dick <laughs> and inches and cockburn and, and balls. The to- and yeah. the toy I will not apologize for cockburn. <laughs> that is the phonetic <laughs> to- spelling of his name. Don't forget the toy king too. <laughs> That's yeah, right. right. Exactly. That's right. All right. So let me let me address this question though, because the, when he asked us this, it actually kind of got me thinking. Right. So one of the things that a lot of people gave. Greg Roman criticism for uh, when he came here was that once NFL defenses figure his system out, like it's done, right? We've seen it multiple times. We saw it in Buffalo. We saw it in San it Francisco. Didn't, it didn't right? help that we heard all the all the crap from Lamar about all oh, they're calling out our place. Right. Let's remind right. us. Let's not forget about that. But the thing that Greg Roman has never had is Lamar Jackson, right? And I get it. Defenses that last year when he had his MVP year, nobody could stop him because nobody knew what to do. Nobody knew how to contain the offense. But as the season kind of went on, teams got adjusted. So we knew that that was going to be a speed bump this year. How was this year going to go? And no, he didn't throw for 4,000 yards. He didn't throw for anywhere near as many yards he threw last year. But the Ravens are still sitting at 11 and five. They're now in the divisional round of the playoffs, right? Lamar Jackson is still one of the best quarterbacks in the league. You can't judge him based on passing yards. You have to judge him based on wins, losses, efficiency, clutch. And he got all those monkeys off his back with this win against the Tennessee Titans. This goes to show that Greg Roman, Greg Roman's system can work even when adjusted for if you've got the right player and you've got the right personnel around him. Colin Kaepernick, I think he was a good player and he looked great for a year in San Francisco when before defenses got adjusted to him. But as soon as defenses got adjusted to him, he fell apart. That offense fell apart, and they were not the same. To, to the defense there, though, I mean, it was it was called out. We've called it out before. Greg Roman didn't adjust himself, right? He didn't. He didn't. He, he expect. Let me phrase that. He adjusted trying to turn Colin Kaepernick into a throwing quarterback. And it just didn't happen. He didn't allow Colin to actually be the mobile quarterback that he was. So to that to that defense, I do I think Colin Kaepernick should be deserved of of saying you know in the same breath as Lamar. I don't think so. I think they're two at two different levels. Who's better, Colin Kaepernick or Deshaun Watson? <laughs> <laughs> Moving along. <laughs> Moving along. Oh, uh, no. So I, look, I, I think when it comes down to it. I think Craig has a point that that there is an evolution here, right? And I think there's an evolution in mentality and the real sum, the sum of all this. Sum of the bitch. (laughs) The sum sum of all this comes in that post-game interview. We didn't talk about this. That post-game interview where Lamar just absolutely fucking shut down Lisa Salters. Oh, it was great. It was well, but he didn't let her finish. So I like I get it to his. She was like, it was billed as you versus Derrick Henry. Like, and, but he immediately was like, no, we play two different positions. I'm a quarterback. He's a running back. Our team got our job done tonight. This that's was the matters. Ravens versus Titans. Exactly. Yeah. And that's that's what I love about Lamar. Lamar. Lamar is the furthest from a me guy when it comes oh, to, yeah. you know, all the accolades and all that stuff. Literally since day one, since he stepped in the castle. Since he was drafted. His, it was, you're going to get a quarterback. You're going to get a, a Super Bowl. You're going to get a Super Bowl out of me. You're right. At the draft room. And then when he stepped in the castle, when he talked to Ray Lewis, his first statement to Ray Lewis was, I want to be the Tom Brady of Baltimore. What is Tom Brady to to New England? He's a six time Super Bowl champion and elevates the people around him to an extent. Right. This isn't him saying I want to win eight MVPs and be the next you know Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant who's just got I don't want to make the big, He didn't say titles. I want to make the I want to be the best highest paid quarterback. Right. He, He's going to be. He wanted to bring <laughs> championships to Baltimore, and, and again, that, there's that's why. His coaches love him so much. That's why his teammates love him so much. It's why so many people believe in this guy. And uh, I, I, there's just there's nothing to dislike about him. Did yeah. you see per- uh, Ed Reed said that was a bad sportsmanship for not shaking hands? I did see his tweet. Uh, it was it, yeah, it was pretty pretty short. I, um, I, I I yes, I heard I saw it. Ed Reed is if if you've ever seen Ed Reed's interviews, uh, he's very like. What's the word I'm looking for? 
uh, very structured, right? And he holds his holds his teammates up to a, a high standard, right? Even like remember the interview we the talked interview about where he throw, like talking about throwing the stuff on the floor, throwing the towels on the floor, and him yeah. getting pissed off at his teammates for throwing towels on the floor, and somebody else having to pick up after him. Like he holds his teammates to a high standard, and I get, like I said, from an old school mentality, I get why that might be a sign of dis disrespect. Take your wins just like you take your losses. And be a man and kind of walk off the field and shake hands like but you would. And I be think respectful. I think Lamar's whole point. I mean, that's the first time I can recall in history, in game, you blatantly during a play. It was caught on live television that you see a guy looking at a quarterback. I've never seen Lamar so pissed off. And this he was pissed. Yeah, this he this, was ready to go. He do you remember this stems back to the last time that they played? Week 11. Butler was on the field barking at the coach. Then the next thing you see is when Lamar Jackson, I think he threw a touchdown to, uh, it might have been Mark Andrews. Yeah, when he's barking at the sideline. No, he goes, Lamar Andrews goes into the to the end zone to celebrate with Mark Andrews and then gives a shoulder bump to, oh, to Butler, Butler as he's walking yeah, out, of the, yeah, yeah. out of the end zone. That's, yeah, that's right. So, yeah, like, I think, I think Lamar has had something personal with Butler since then, and then Butler, again, it continued to this game, gives him the middle finger, uh, and I think Lamar was just done with it. said, fuck you. If you're going to disrespect me like that, we're not shaking hands. There's nothing to shake. We're right. walking off. I, I, I get Lamar's mentality there, right? It's There, there is – look, I, I get that you know there is a thing of like getting into your, the other team's head, but it, it, seemed, it seemed to have crossed a line. I mean, they, this is a team that was also ushering – not only was it Lamar running off the field, they were ushering Marcus Peters off the fucking field. Yeah, it was no, no, no. We need you for next week. Let's go, let's yeah. go. You need to go. You need to go. Like you saw the, he was like that. Coach was his handler. Like that's what it was. Go it ahead. was at the end of the game. You cover Marcus. That's that's the point. Is everything in life is about return on investment. What was the positive that could come out of shaking his hand? Is he looks a little bit better, like a sportsman. The negatives of a twenty twenty interaction. There could have been fights that could have got you suspended from the game that you're going to play yeah, next yeah. week. They're going to get suspended week one next year. What do they care about getting suspended week one? You're in the playoffs. Number two, you got increased COVID exposure. I don't want any of these players interacting. Yeah. How many times this week, this year have we seen somebody come up positive the day after a game? Right. I don't need any more interaction. The yeah. game's over. Let's get in the in there, not catch, catch COVID, wear our masks, and get to the playoffs. I like it. Go ahead, Drew. Yeah, I'm with you. I never This year, I'm kind of, fine with no one shaking hands Limit the interaction. Right. The, the basketball Ed, players, they give a salute, and then Ed they walk off. Yeah. yeah. Ed, Ed Reed it lived, lived, played in a different era. era. Agreed. Yeah. You were playing against Peyton Manning and Tom Brady and Ben Ben, and you were losing to them. Let's be a little bit honest. You were losing to them. They were class acts, and there was no one, even in the heat of battle, and, and you didn't have Troy Palomalu giving you the finger. You didn't have Harrison yeah. giving you like you know what I mean like you didn't have none of these idiots were stomping. Joey logos. Porter was close. Uh, I, he was yeah, close. he's a yeah. douchebag. <laughs> well, I mean, so, but, so, well, you got Troy Owens. You don't have the internet with all these kids. All these kids. All these players just want to make. You already got. You're making a name by being on the goddamn field. Right. You didn't have that back so, then. So when you have to deal with when players have to deal with that shit this time, I'm fine with the disrespect. The the other thing that the other thing I would say here is the fact that did anybody else pick up on. That the the post game handshake between Harbaugh and Vrabel seemed a little bit like long. Like Vrabel kept trying to walk away, and Harbaugh like kept like Harbaugh Harbaugh kept talking. Vrabel was trying. It seemed like Vrabel was trying to walk away. That last and interaction with with Vrabel and him before the game was a nightmare. So I those those coaches well, hate each other as much as anything else. To right. that point, though, they did have uh, mic'd up uh, of the coaches pregame this game pregame and they were laughing about how the media was making it out to be funny like how would these guys yeah. fare in a fist fight against each other Ray and Harbaugh, kick his ass. Harbaugh oh. was kind of <laughs> joking uh, you know yeah. Harbaugh was joking about it so it actually seemed at that point prior to this game this weekend it seemed kind of lighthearted. right I want to know what, what the mic I want to know what the mic'd up was post game it, conveniently seemed, they didn't play that one. right exactly it seemed like Vrabel Gave the handshake, said something, and he went to go pull away, and Harbaugh pulled him back in. Yeah. Which I thought, I was like, all right, what the hell's being said now? Right. Like, because now is it, hey, motherfucker, stop on our field again. Watch what happens. So the other like, thing, 
The other thing that I respect is the fact that Lamar owned it. We just watched Brady do this to Nick Foles a couple weeks ago, and he's like, oh, yeah. oh I just didn't see him. I forgot this, mm-hmm. that, and the other. No, Lamar said there's no reason for me to shake their hands. Like, yeah. just, I just owned Good it. Good point. So I, I respect that, too. Go ahead, James. Not to oh. get off the subject, but the best was, I don't know if you saw it, was when the Bears were losing the last uh, touchdown of the game with Jimmy <laughs> Graham. He just went right in the fucking locker room. That was room. great. Yeah, that was great. He's gone. Done. There, was, no there was no reason to celebrate or shake hands. <laughs> yeah, we no. just got our asses kicked. I cut a touchdown. It's probably my last touchdown of my career. I'm out. I'm in yeah. the locker room. I don't so Lamar just ran straight down the tunnel. Was... <laughs> and he took, but the no, thing but is, he was, he like was calling everybody else in with him. Yeah. yeah. He was calling everybody else in with him. He didn't want anybody shaking hands. <laughs> yeah. Which, to and your then point. they bring him back out because he's got to get to do an interview. No, All it takes is Butler throwing a fist and 30 dudes are going to be fighting. Right? Yeah. If you're not going to let Jess Butler and whoever get suspended, 30 dudes are going to be fighting, and you're going to be playing with half a squad next week right. against either the Chiefs or the Bills. In we the playoffs, yeah. You, right. can't, you can't afford it. I, I agree with you. <laughs> and you're right, especially with Butler pulling the shit where he yeah. does the flop with uh, Dez. Yeah, but right. you know Butler what I mean? like it, that. It's telegraphed. It would have happened. So, yeah, I, I think there's there's a lot to be said here. There's a lot that, that we look at and we say, like, you know, look, I get it. We understand it. I think it was the right move. I agree with you, Ryan. There's there's just too much going on there. Uh, we've got some comments coming through. Uh, Craig Zero, let's bring up his comment because yes. he's right there. He says Harbaugh wanted him to stay so he could see who is the better coach. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I could see that. <laughs> and how about this one? Harbaugh was thanking him for punting the fourth and two. Yes. <laughs> Play of the game. Yeah. That's a game changer. If that had been the the Ravens, 100% Harbaugh's going for that. A hundred percent. I think Verb of uh, April wanted to hurry up and get to uh, Henry. Be like, what the fuck you do all game, man? Like, <laughs> well, like I said, there was some chirping going back it. and forth on I them. think I think that was chirping about the offensive line, if I'm being honest. Because that offensive line was not giving him many holes. Right. And it, 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 more power to the Ravens defense and defense in front, as we talked about. But it's just, it, it was just, there were no holes for Derrick Henry. <laughs> and when he was there, the linebackers with McQueen and even McPhee, the doubling back and grabbing him, it was just it was too perfect. That defense played really well. I think your your point of giving Wink the game ball, I think you got a point there. Yeah. But, but oh, go ahead. To get on to your uh, point, Scott, do you think since they said we know how uh, Larry Hogan is, are they allowed? Do you think maybe the Orioles might play their their whole games down in spring training area, Sarasota? So to I get fans. In there? I've I've said this. You're not making any money of them being up here. Uh, I thought it was stupid for EMLB to you know make the comments that they did. We're in a spike right now. I think we all we all can see it from the numbers. It spikes across the country. But I think this is where you say, look, we're gonna play up. We are guaranteeing that we're playing up until the all star the the quote unquote all star break in Florida and Arizona at your respective field. So everybody's in a contained area, right? So somewhat of a contained area. You're not traveling state to state to state to state because that's where it's most it's most transmissible. If you're within the state, it's going to happen. At that point, probably you're going to have to shut down the league. Either way, it's going to be worse if you're with the traveling, mm-hmm. right? We saw, we saw games get delayed. I don't think you get 162-game season in this year. I think you're lucky if you get 100. Especially when you said no testing. Or is that just so a- no, 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 no testing for fans. They're not going to require fans to show proof of vaccination or proof of a negative They'll test in order temperature to test before you go in. It, it will be, but it, you're if you're asymptomatic, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it turns out to mean almost nothing too. It's, right. it's all it's like fake security at the airport. It just no, makes you feel better. Like- right, <laughs> but at that point, do they have to say, Metal "Hey, goes off, you're we're good. at the um, <laughs> keep on going." Uh, the stadium authority that the games have to play in Cam New York, or can they say, hey, if that's okay, you're not going to let us in. We're going to go to Sarasota and play all our games. I mean, they have a contract they have to honor with the stadium authority regardless, so the stadium authority is getting paid on it. You already own the facility down there, so if you're going to be allowed to have fans and you're trying to make some money, you're going to have a better shot it's of not, it in Florida than yeah, you are not, in Maryland. I don't so know if you ever been there, it's not a bad stadium. I, oh, I so I was there the first year that it opened. I've I like it they sucked the past two years. Yeah, the past two years I haven't gone, but I like we used to make a religious and we talked about it. We actually talked about it pre this year that we all wanted to go down there and and have a time at like go down to Siesta Key, hit Sarasota, like all that stuff. I want to go down there, but it's just one of those things. There's too much going on right now. 
for them to, to warrant these teams playing there. And look, you still don't know what the hell's going to happen with Toronto. Look what happened last year with Toronto. These states could start cracking down saying we're not allowing it, right? You're not, we're not making any, any revenue off of the, um, uh, shit, what's the, the, the tourism. You're not making any tourism revenue, right? I can't go up to, to Yankee stadium and watch the game. So what the hell's the point? They're making a lot of tax money off it. That's why. Everywhere they play, they pay taxes. They don't pay taxes where their home state is. But if you wind, if you wind up, you put, yes, you pay taxes where you play. But if tax in Florida is, I think it's 8%, right? And actually, technically, I don't think there's an income tax there's in no Florida. no state income tax in Florida. Right. So, A, it's better for the players. You keep them happier. Yeah, I'm just saying the other states won't ban it because they're losing money if it goes somewhere else. They want to keep the tax revenue that... There's so little tax revenue this year, yeah. but that, I don't know. That that I don't know. That the, I don't know that the tax revenue is in, is enough to warrant the risk that they're posing, right? To these to, in these hotels and things like that. That you get it. These hotel like hotels aren't fucking testing people every day. They're doing the, they're doing the temperature check, right? They're doing what every other doing employer outside of a hospital is doing, and is a temperature check. I like I can tell you right now. I know multiple companies between family members, myself. That all the company does is a temperature check, and if you're asymptomatic, a temperature check means absolutely nothing. It means nothing because, especially the guy, the guys that are playing the game right now, the majority of them fall into that category of guys that are our age or younger. They tend to be asymptomatic. I think Definitely. mostly younger. Definitely. Like, almost younger. all the way younger. Younger than, mostly younger than Fred. Scott, we're old and falling that's, apart. That's, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> all right, <laughs> last, <laughs> Fred. last topic in the uh, the uh, two, or the uh, right. after, after hours hour show. Uh, Ryan, I know you said you wanted to go at Scott on something. Was it the, the Tomlin debate? I think it was Tomlin. Oh, yeah. I just, I just don't, <laughs> I don't know how you could get Tomlin fired. I think, I think we pretty much covered it, but what, what, who are you replacing him with? It's the hardball argument. Like, there's no one to replace Tomlin with. That guy's doomed. That's just like Turgeon. Turgeon was doomed the day he took the job after Gary Williams. You don't want to be the guy replacing the legend. Tomlin's a legend. But to that, to the point of what James and Drew kind of pointed out, and I think Fred pointed out too, how many coaches have been in their career? Is this the time to turn the page just like they did with Coach Cower and turning it over to Tomlin? It was a. It was in that stage where they weren't sure. It was an in between year. There was a lot going on. Tomlin gets a year, gets his team set, starts rolling. This could be the and year. Again, Cower moved to TV. He didn't get fired. And no, Cower, go yeah, that was a Cower no, choice. Ka Cower wanted to spend more time with his daughter. That's what yeah. I'm saying. It was a Cower choice. If, but if I, Tomlin I get, makes that choice. I understand. I, I understand. I, I do kind of get what <laughs> Scott's saying. I don't 100 percent agree with it, but I get what you're saying because. I mean, what's he been a head coach since 2008? Same year Harbaugh came in, right? So what's that, yes. thir 13, so 13 years now? This will be the 13th year. That's a long time for an NFL coach, especially in this day and age, right? And if you are going through not a complete rebuild. But, but if you're turning the you're, page. You're turning the page on your franchise quarterback who's been there for the last you know 13 years with you in, uh, in Ben Roethlisberger. And you want to get a new style. You want to get a new, fresh philosophy in there because maybe you are losing some of these players. I don't know. This 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 behavior by the players is why I brought this up. Is is what's most alarming to me. None of this shit with Juju Clay and Claypool. War, none of this shit would have flown around <laughs> ten years ago. With Cower would have ripped him. them all a new fucking I, asshole. He would have ripped them a new <laughs> asshole. Talking about Tomlin ten years ago. Something's True. changed. Something's different. He's become. I don't know if it's like a soft. Steven thing. says he was hired one year before Harbaugh. Yeah. Okay. All right. So he's been there for fourteen years. Then uh, I, I don't know. I, I I just I don't think that he's done anything to lose his job i think if ownership feels like they need to go in a new direction because they need a new set of eyes and they need a new philosophy but that's in there, why maybe that's why i that made the statement of when's his contract up right because if his contract is up let's say next year then i think last year might be tomlin's last year depending on what happens like if let's say let's say i'm just throwing out there this out there for speculation right and and thought process if you have a guy that's in his last year of his contract like Tomlin and you're ready to turn a page like they are, you if you're the St Steelers organization, there's one guy that I'm going after. 
That's Eric Bieniemy. Because out of all the choices that Eric Bieniemy would have in that situation, he's if that to, were the, he's going to the Steelers. If that were the situation, the huh? He's going to the Chargers. I'm saying Probably. if he has his option to say Chargers, Miami, Steelers, wherever, he's going to the Steelers. I just got a news outbreak. Uh, the Steelers traded um, Tomlins to New England for Belichick. <laughs> And, and both and of them are tired. And they're training for Deshaun Watson. <laughs> yeah, I want to see this XFL uh, team next year with Tomlin coaching, Deshaun Watson at quarterback. <laughs> they're going to be awesome. Tim Tebow's quarterback coach. <laughs> Tim Tebow's quarterback coach. That's a good one, yeah. All right, guys. We appreciate you tuning in. As always, we'll be back next Tuesday. Hopefully, still hung over after another big Ravens win. Uh, I'll be. I'll be happy with that. Either way, we're either going to be real happy or real depressed. See you next Tuesday.